Hi friends, this is Andrei Vasilenko here, and today we've got something very interesting for you. This is things you may not have known about Metallica in ASMR. Let's begin. So, I like doing my horror movie reviews and stuff like that, but it's been a while since I did a vinyl related one, right? And I know how much y'all love those. So, I was down getting some rations, looking for inspiration, as most of my videos are inspired by, and came across this lovely beer, Ride the Lightning Amber Ale with Ginger and Lime by Foamer's Folly. So, Obviously, this is a reference to Metallica's 1984 second album, Ride the Lightning, but it's, it's rye, as in like rye and wheat and barley, hops, oat, all that sort of thing. And it's a tasty little piece, that's for sure. And I thought, well, if we got Metallica beer, then we gotta talk about the band Metallica. Possibly one of the biggest, if not the biggest, metal bands of all time. And definitely one of my favorites, that is for sure. I know that because they are quite the mainstream, well-known band, there's definitely a lot of haters and, and dissers and stuff like that, as, as is how it is, you know. Like, I, I think, not my favorite band, but I think the Beatles are, like, the greatest band of all time. But I know many people are, you know, just against that because, you know, they're too popular and they're overrated and stuff. So Metallica, I think, definitely gets a bit of a rep when it comes to that sort of thing. Which is unfortunate because I don't really care about the popularity or stuff. I just listen to it if it's good. And... No, I've not really grown out of the Metallica listening phase, that's for sure. Nice, good beer, that's for sure. So, my first introduction to Metallica was actually the bonus features on the Mission Impossible 2 DVD, because Metallica had made the song I Disappear for that movie. It was in the credits. Um, and it's funny because I didn't know much about Metallica at the time. I was pretty young and I had this idea of what they might sound like and this song didn't really fit what I thought they were going to be. Which is funny because that is from an era of the band where their sound was drastically different than what it was when they started. So before I even knew anything about the band, I already was thinking this doesn't sound like real Metallica, which is something, you know, we'll, we'll get to later when we talk about those albums, but it was a funny thing. And then, I had a good friend of mine get me into Metallica by giving me this DVD here, which is a collection of their music videos from 1989 to 2004. So... Metallica was not really about doing music videos in the early stage of their career. Uh, they didn't have any made for the first three albums, and they only had one music video made for the song One. And the idea about this one is that it was supposed to be like an antithesis to the style of music videos at the time in the 80s, which were all, you know, hair metal bands and big hair and lots of women and bright lights. And so this one was basically just them jamming out in a warehouse and it's all black and white. And it has shots inserted of this film, Johnny's Got His Gun, which uh, they had watched as inspiration for that song. Again, we'll talk about it more on the album. And then the rest of it, it's mostly songs from the Black Album, Load Reload, and a bit of Save Anger. Because then it got to the point where they were making music videos for every single 
off the album. Um, and they had a lot of singles released off these ones because they were quite popular. So definitely a good collection, that's for sure. Um, but this would not be what you would only use to get into Metallica because obviously this is missing the first three albums um, and only has one song off a fourth album. It's primarily the 90s stuff. Um, and there's a bit of a Garage Days thrown in here as well, so that is pretty cool. It's a good intro piece, that's for sure, but not to their 80s sound. That is something uh, entirely on a different level than this here. Definitely very good, though. That's for sure. Always a nice little piece of nostalgia. This one is, you know, it would be really crazy if they made something like this now to have all the videos because like their most recent album at the time of filming this they had a music video released for every song on that album and it's a pretty long album too it's like 77 minutes so you know that's pretty crazy <laughs> but of course the best place to start is at the beginning you know Unless this were a Christopher Nolan movie, then the beginning would be somewhere kind of there-ish, and the ending would be somewhere kind of here. You know, <laughs> but that, that's not how we're going to do it this time. So, let us begin. So Metallica was formed in San Francisco, I believe it was, with main members being drummer Lars Ulrich and rhythm guitar player slash vocalist James Hetfield. And they had enlisted the help of bass player, uh, is it Ron, Ron McGoverney? I believe that's how you say his last name. Um, and uh, lead guitar player Dave Mustaine. And so they uh, were very much a new wave of British heavy metal stylized band. Um, not that they were British, but this, what was called the new wave of British heavy metal, you've probably seen it abbreviated, was like a lot of these British bands that were coming out of that late 70s punk era, and then they were really pushing like the technicality and the aggressiveness and the rawness of the music. So you think like a punk music song, you know, like something like Sex Pistols or Anarchy in the UK, right? But then you take that and now make it so there's more focus on like technical structural guitar riffs and solos and double bass drumming. It's all real fast and intense. All right, so I think Iron Maiden's first album, uh, very much one of the pinnacles of new wave of British heavy metal, or Judas Priest had already been around for a while, but their stuff was more of like a, a hard rock sort of thing. Like I think some of the stuff on Sad Wings of Destiny, it's almost more comparable to Queen at the time, because Queen was actually pretty heavy um, for the 70s, like Stone Cold Crazy, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, and then Judas Priest finally became a real metal band. Uh, in the 80s with, um, what is it, British Steel, Breaking the Law, Metal Gods, um, and then that continued further with stuff like uh, Screaming for Vengeance and uh, Riding on the Wind, You Got Another Thing Coming, and um, Defenders of the Faith, uh, Love Bites, um, Free Wheel Burden, right? Like the earlier stuff, like The Ripper and Victim of Changes, it's hard rock, um, but then you get to stuff like that, and that's really the real metal. So Metallica was really heavily inspired by a lot of that, or um, obviously Motorhead, who they would dispute whether they're a metal band. I'm pretty sure Lemmy liked to say, we're Motorhead, and we play rock and roll. But, you know, a song like Overkill, where the drums, the entire song, is just double bass. Right. That's a pretty lousy attempt. There we go. Right. 
So that was Metallica is like heavily inspired by all these bands. And did a couple shows here and there. They were writing some stuff. And then eventually uh, Ron McGovern left. I don't know on what the terms were, but it was basically because they found uh, Cliff Burton. And unfortunately, if you're trying to be a bass player in a band and the other guy they're considering is Cliff Burton, you're probably going to lose because Cliff Burton is a, was a phenomenal bass player. He had such a cool lead guitar approach to the bass. Um, I remember, I guess they saw him at a show with his other band and he was just totally invested in this bass solo. And I had to go up close and like count the strings um, to realize that's not a guitar, that's a bass. And that's always the best stuff when you realize that the guitar is not a guitar, it's a bass. Um, so then they had got a bunch of stuff arranged and they had this little cassette tape, um, the No Life to Leather EP, as it's called, a little cassette they just copied and distributed around to friends. And they were all set to record an album, but their relationship with lead guitarist Dave Mustaine was, let's just say it was not going very well. Um, and eventually they kicked him out of the band very unceremoniously. You know, they were just like, woke him up one day and they had packed his bags for him and like, you're out. Right? Um, and so that's why Dave Mustaine was so furious. He went and um, decided he was going to make his own band and they were going to be heavier and faster and thrashier and speedier and more metal and metallic could ever be. And I guess in a way, they were a heavier band. They stuck to it a little more. Um, but I prefer Metallica. Of course, the other band that Dave Mustaine then formed was Megadeth, another one of the big four thrash metal bands. Megadeth is a fantastic band, that's for sure. But I don't know their back catalog nearly as well as I do Metallica. They've got some really hidden gems on there. And Megadeth made Rust in Peace which is only, like, one of the greatest things ever made by a human, you know? <laughs> For those of you who follow the satirical website The Onion, I do, because they're always so hilarious in writing good satire. Um, they had this satire article they wrote. And it was, um, like, humanity still producing new art, even though Megadeth's Rust in Peace already exists. The idea was basically like, why are we bothering trying to make new music when whatever we make will not be as good as Rest in Peace? It's just like, you know, you can make an album, it'll be decent, but it's not Rest in Peace. It's not the blistering guitar solos in Holy Wars and Tornado of Souls, so why bother? Right. But back to the other big four thrash battle whose name starts with an M. Uh, Metallica and had the lineup. Uh, Dave Mustaine was replaced by Kirk Hammett, who had been in Exodus, um, and thus we had the complete lineup. And the first album came out in 1983, and it was Kill 'Em All. losing a battle and the classic Metallica logo with like the kind of a lightning bolt horns thing going on there. Very, very nice, very metal. Great debut album. And on the back here we have this quote, bang the head that doesn't bang from R. Birch 83. And some lovely photos of the band member Kirk Hammett on lead guitar, Cliff Burton trying his best to be social on bass, Lars Ulrich on the drums, and James Hetfield rhythm guitar and vocals. So, the album was originally going to be called Metal Up Your Ass, and it had this picture of a toilet with a hand with a dagger coming out of the toilet, you know? Um, but 
the studio wouldn't let him do that. So then Cliff Burton, I'm pretty sure it was, who said, like, oh, you know, screw those guys. We should just kill them all. And then, of course, hence, that's how that was born. Though it's funny because on um, the um, that little tour Metallica did where they were filming for the Through the Never video, they had, like, a giant, like, toilet with a metal up your ass coming out of it. So they referenced that when they played uh, Seek and Destroy. That's pretty cool. So, I might have to limit what I say, because on some of these albums I could probably rant for a while about every single song, and then this video would be quite a long one, indeed. I managed to make it for two and a half hours on the Pink Floyd video, wonder if I could make it to three on the Metallica, we'll see. So, this album is pretty perfect from back to front. It is uh, mostly a fast-paced album, because it's 80s thrash, so you know, it's like hard and fast and brutal. Um, it starts off with Hit the Lights, which just is like the perfect way to start a discography. I mean, just a big thunderous E chord fading in, big drum solo, and then just kicks you into gear. Um, and then it's got a nice outro solo as well, a very, very well put together one. Um, next we have The Four Horsemen, obviously The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. So this is where we get the first big Metallica Megadeth controversy, because Four Horsemen was originally a Dave Mustaine written song, which he called uh, the Mechanics or the Mechanics, um, which was the closing track on Megadeth's first album, Killing Is My Business, and Business Is Good. Um, so, even though Four Horsemen was not written by the other members, it was written by him, they still ended up using it. But they reworked the song. Um, the original Mechanics is a very fast song that doesn't have much of a bridge. It's a short one. Um, and so then, for this, they slowed the tempo down a bit. They changed the lyrics, and they added this section in the middle that's different. So, like, the original song has that, like... But then Metallica had that bit where it goes. And then there's the slower bit, which is the Sweet Home Alabama part. The one that everyone talks about. Oh, it looks like, it sounds like Sweet Home Alabama. Which it's, it's not, it's different enough. Which is sad because I think because it sounds so similar Metallica usually skips that part when they play it live. And I'm like, that's like the best part of the song, right? Because it's like, and there's a bass bit in the background. It's like, and then a really, really sweet, slow, but fastish, whatever I'm saying, solo. listen from that then it goes back into the rest of the song um but yeah you can tell that it is literally the same riffs and even the solo phrasings are the same like the last solo it opens with a, a similar lick so a little bit of controversy there that's for sure um then we have motor breath another fun short one probably the most punk sounding of these ones but you know, it is still a thrash riff. It's a thrash song. Uh, and then Jump in the Fire, which is pretty interesting because that one's in, like, a key of G, would it be? And normally with Metallica stuff, they're writing it in E because it's in E tuning. Um, e or A, something like that. Occasionally, there's usually a bit where they'll have the main riff is in E and then the pre-chorus will be the same verse riff that was in E, but now it's in F-sharp, right? It gives you this sense of 
rising intensity. Just like the regular riff, right? It's E. And then we bump it up to F sharp, right? Like it's ascending. A lot of songs by Metallica that do that. I'll probably try to point them out if possible. Um, but Jump in the Fire, it's in G, which is not necessarily one we always see our songs written in. So that's pretty cool. Um, really great outro solo as well. I think that's a, a very underrated song by Metallica. Next we have Anesthesia Pulling Teeth, or as we like to say, Bass Solo Take One. Wow! Heavy distorted sound. So Anesthesia Pulling Teeth, it's a bass solo, and it's showing off Cliff Burton's real technical bass playing abilities and his classical influence. Um, because it really much feels like like some kind of classical piece, like a sonnet or something like that. But it's all distorted bass, so it's classical, but it's metal. And yeah, he used like, uh, like I think a Big Muff Distortion, Ibanez Tube Screamer with like a Morley Fuzz Wah pedal and a compressor. And it just goes crazy, and then the drums come in in the second half, and just gets more and more technical. It's a very impressive solo, very well done. I, as a bass player myself, I have always been trying to nail the Cliff Burton sound uh, unsuccessfully, but I think I've gotten close here and there. You know, it's just such a great tone, that's for sure. And that song then leads into the final one on side one, which is Whiplash. And Whiplash then is another back to basics E fast thrashy one. Um, that's really great because it has the line in there, we'll never stop, we'll never quit, because we're Metallica. When they do it live, they say, we'll never stop, we'll never quit, because you're Metallica. You know, shout out to the fans who have helped make the band what they are. Then on side two, we have Phantom Lord, which I think is another underrated one, pretty good one. Um, and it's the first time we hear clean guitars in Metallica's discography. There's a little break in the middle with clean setting, right? So obviously this means that they were sellouts because clean guitars on a 80s thrash album, that is unacceptable. So Metallica are obviously sellouts from this point onwards. I am glad we have established that so that nobody complains about them being sellouts later. Um, next we have what I think is my favorite song off the album, which is another underrated run, and that's uh, No Remorse. That one starts off with a solo section, a little odd for the structure, and that opening punch just punches you right. Bow, da, da, da. And then it's got all those little great instrumental bits in the middle, lots of really great bass, love the bass tone. But it's too bad that I'm pretty sure Metallica cuts out the final part to this song at the end, right? Where it's that fast drum roll. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Um, it truly is an epic song. Um, it is more so overshadowed by the next song, which is the song that I believe Metallica has played live the most. If not the most, then at virtually every show. Uh, and that is Seek and Destroy. Yeah, Seek and Destroy, that's probably like... If we're not counting Anesthesia, I think that might be the slowest song on the album. Because it's not at a fast pace, only in the middle. But it's definitely a good crowd pleaser, that's for sure. Maybe it's one you hear a million times, but come on, it all gets you pumped, right? Search it! Seek and destroy! Bum, 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 battle now, search it! great. 
Uh, and then it ends with my least favorite on the album, and I think that's because it's the one that doesn't really do anything special for me. Uh, and that's Metal Militia, which got some really good riffs, right? With that main riff, you know, boom, bam, 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 bam. It's pretty good. Perhaps it is by association, but like, I think of a lot of times you see those people where it's like a guy with like short hair, beard, black sunglasses, and they're wearing some shirt that's all like metal militia, but it's spelled wrong. And ugh, I don't, I don't like that vibe. Like. This is a thing I noticed at the times I've seen Metallica live, unfortunately, is that I feel like because they're a mainstream metal band, there's a lot of people who aren't that into metal, but they're into them because they want music to be violent too, right? Like, I was on the floor for one of their concerts and it was just such a drastic change than the floor experiences I'm used to because even if there's been like the occasional really drunk person I've still felt like there's a general good vibes around the show right it's like everyone's going a little crazy and wild but it's all because we like the music and we're there to have a good time and everyone's still at least relatively respectful about it the vibe I got at the most recent Metallica show was just that people were there to be violent because it's metal music and oh, metal music, that's like what you get violent to, right? That's what it's for. <laughs> and I really didn't enjoy that. Like, there were some people I saw walk in and I just could tell like the look on their face. I'm like, I'm staying away from you. You're about to get violent. And then, yeah, sure enough, they did. They just started fights the whole time. Um, and then like, people were trying to like mosh and crowd surf like in between every song and even during like the slow songs like Unforgiven like that's like the slow acoustic song and people were like yeah yeah let's mosh and crowd surf I'm like um doesn't this feel a little out of place like I don't want to be that person like oh you know this is how you're properly supposed to mosh but like if some guy is like trying to stand back because he's like got crutches and you're trying to grab him and throw him into the mosh pit during the slow acoustic ballad something's a little off and that is what I saw there so that is a little unfortunate it's a kind of a bad vibes sort of thing I don't like it um yeah not a fan and it's like such a contrast like I saw Iron Maiden on the floor and like yeah, it was crazy, but like everyone was there partying and we're all, you know, like, live to fly, aces high. Like, it was fun. So, anyway, enough about that. <laughs> so, got a lyrical insert here. Some lovely photos again. Lyrics, liner notes. And then the record itself, I mean, I usually don't show them because unless there's something special to see, you know, because for the most part they're all just the same, you know, it's, it's a record, you know, it's like vinyl, regular vinyl, it's black, and it's got a lot of light. Here we have it. Come on. This one's a little dusty. I should probably clean it next time I listen to it, that's for sure. Ooh. Yeah, definitely. Side two. Phantom Lord. No remorse. So yeah, Metallica's first album, huge hit, everyone loved it, maybe not the critics, you know, but yeah, this is not my favorite album of theirs, but it is a really, really good 
well done debut album that really put them on the map. Well, next up is the album that is inspired, that inspired this beer, Ride of the Lightning. Nice. And of course, that gives us Ride the Lightning, Metallica's second album in 1984. This is kind of about the concept of the electric chair, you know, the death penalty. You know, they're gonna kill you, they put you in the chair, zap you with electricity, bam, you're dead. Electric chair, you're gonna ride the lightning. And this album, then, same lineup, um, was definitely a step in a further evolution of the band's sound because the songs are starting to get a little longer, a little more varied in like lyrical matter and um, tempo, pacing and all that. And we're starting to see what I consider to be the Metallica formula for establishing the songs on the album and the track list. So we'll sort of establish that here. Um, so what I mean by that is we have the first song is a fast song that starts with like some kind of slow clean intro and all of a sudden it hits you with thrash and then it's really fast throughout the whole thing right very short punchy song then the second track is the title track the third song is a slow heavy song slower tempo than the others at this point and the fourth song is a ballad song that starts off clean and acoustic and slowly starts increasing in heaviness throughout until by the end it's gone back to full on straight heavy with a really blistering emotional guitar solo. And that's usually the first half of the album. And then the second half is kind of interspaced with a couple of like deep cuts, lesser known ones, songs that don't get played or recognized as often. And then it will usually end with a instrumental song, a very, very long instrumental song. And then there's usually a, another fast, punchy song to round out the album, for the most part. Again, this is not a perfect formula. Well, this is kind of general standard way to look at things. So how that applies to Ride the Lightning? Well, first song is Fight Fire with Fire. And this is about, like, biblical quote, like, you know, fight fire with fire, everyone gets burned, and, you know, do unto others as they've done to you. And basically about, like, a nuclear annihilation, right? Starts off with a clean intro, goes real fast and thrashy, and I love the mix of the guitar and bass on this album. Like, the bass sounds like it's buried in the mix, but that's because it's like on an equal level of distortion as the guitars and stuff, so it kind of like blends together for some of those riffs where they're playing similar lines. Really nice sound. Uh, then, title track. Ride the Lightning, this of course being about getting the electric chair. Um, another really great one. There's a fun bit in the solo where like, I think the riff is in, the solo riff is in E, and so Kirk's soloing in E minor, but there's this one little chord run, or this little, this little scale he does where he switches to E major randomly, because it is very interesting sound, and it's cool. I like it. Um, fun fact, I think Lars is credited on Ride the Lightning because he wrote the intro riff. The bow, bow, bow. Right? Real nice. Um, then we have For Whom the Bell Tolls, which has that bell sound effect. And the bell sound is actually the sound of an anvil being struck. It's not a bell. 
And um, there's this common myth that's perpetuated that this bell sample that they had was like at a certain pitch. And so they ended up speeding up the track after it was recorded to match the pitch of the bell sample. And you can notice this on a couple of other songs here and there. I think like um, Creeping Death is another one. A couple songs where they're just slightly tuned above your standard E tuning of like, what is it? 450 hertz, 440, A equals 440 hertz, I think. I don't remember what standard tuning is. I think that's what it is. And then like 432 is like the, the one that expands your mind and opens everything, the door to the cosmos. Um, but if you try to play along to For Whom the Bell Tolls or Creeping Death, um, they're going to sound a little off if you're tuned to standard tuning. And that's because those songs, they just simply sped them up a little bit after they were recorded. They just sped up the tape. And this is just to, like, make the song sound a little punchier than the tempo it was recorded at. Um, so that's why For Whom the Bell Tolls was sped up. It was not to match the sample. Um, it was to, you know, give it a little more oomph. Right. And I like that. I think bands need to do that more often, like, kind of, like, tune in between the tunings, you know? Like, I think some of Machine Head's stuff on Unto the Locust is tuned that way, potentially, that's what I've heard, but I haven't tried playing along to it. Um, and then I'm pretty sure, like, Killing Technology by Voivod is tuned, like, slightly flat, than your normal E tuning. And, um, oh, Pantera. Pantera's stuff is also like a weird in between. It's not E flat, but it's not E. It's like in the middle somewhere. That one you have to be tuned particularly different to, to match it properly. I don't know if that was a result of the tuning or if it was a result of like speeding or slowing down the tape though. Um, little bits like that, you know. And then, of course, you get to the ultimate extreme of that, which is um, Flying Microtonal Banana by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, where it's all 24 scale and playing the notes in between notes and weird proggy Middle Eastern Turkish stuff, you know. It's really cool. Um, but back to the album here. Uh, we have Fade to Black, which is the first proper Metallica ballad, um, and it has clean guitars, but we know that this was not where Metallica sold out, because they already sold out on Kill Em All when they put clean guitars for like five seconds in the middle of Phantom Lord, so it's not a sellout song. Um, it is a suicide song, because the band was all depressed that their equipment had gotten stolen, and... I think it's a really perfect example of the metallic and ballad where you start off with a slow clean section. The chorus comes in and now it's more heavy and distorted. And then eventually you get to like a new sound, a new heavy riff that keeps building the intensity until you have this guitar solo where it just all gets let loose in emotion. And it has a heavy ending. And yeah, fade to black. Very, very great one. That's for sure. So then we get to the deep cuts, the, the B-sides, so to speak, um, which is Trapped Under Ice, which is a straightforward, fast, thrashy one. That one could have been the closing track, I think, if we were following the formula of having the last song be another fast one. Pretty much about Trapped Under Ice, you know. If there's any a scene like that in a film where a character is underwater like that and they can't escape, well, of course, I'm right there going, Freezing! Get him, I go! I am dying to live! Wow! I'm trapped under ice! Uh, then we have the most 
not controversial is the word, but like out of place early Metallica song, which is Escape. And that's because this one was written last minute as per a studio request to throw something a little more mainstream and marketable on the album. And you can tell that it's definitely a last minute addition because a lot of the riffs on this song feel like they're discount versions of riffs that were on Call of Cthulhu, even though that song is later on the album, but knowing the order they were written, then this would be second. Um, and the chorus is odd because it has a major key chorus. Major key, again, very out of place for metal. Normally you want that minor key, downer, depressing, distorted sound, as opposed to the more bright major key. And Metallica, of course, are not fond of it, and they never played that one live until they were doing a anniversary show for Ride the Lightning. And they had to play it because they were playing the whole album. And, you know, you can tell they, uh, they weren't really that into it. Um, but, you know, I still think they made it sound good, and I like the way they ended it. Um, I think it's a decent song, but it's definitely the least awesome on this album, that's for sure. Um, that middle bit, like, I think James tries to stretch his voice a little too low. The bridge of the song, right? Um, but you know, it's it's decent. That's for sure. A, a not great Metallica song is still miles better than a lot of other bands' best. And Gojira covered it, which is pretty cool because you know, you cover a Metallica song, you wouldn't necessarily pick Escape as the first song you're gonna cover. That would be like if you were going to cover a Led Zeppelin song and you picked Hats Off to Roy Harper as the one you covered, right? Or like, um, Hot Dog off of In Through the Outdoor. I'm not saying those are bad songs, but like, you know, they're, they're not Achilles Last Stand or Dazed and Confused or Communication Breakdown. It's Hats Off to Roy Harper. <laughs> um... But yeah, and then I also think, yeah, it's, it's cool Gojira covered that, especially because Gojira, right, they're like a, you know, are they death metal, exactly? I don't know what Gojira is, groove metal, death metal, I don't know, they're, 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 they're awesome, that's what it is. They're awesome, and they're heavy, and they talk about whales, I like it. Um, but they don't really do guitar solos in their songs. They have leads, but not solos. Uh, so it was cool seeing them cover that song and do solos proper. Right. Here you go, some more inserts with the photos. Line up. Love those leather jackets and that 80s hair that I'm hopefully working my way towards. Only my hair is naturally curly. It's not straight. This one was produced by Metallica with engineering by Fleming Raz Rasmussen. And I know he worked with a couple other albums coming up. And lyrics as well. Metallica's fight for world domination has been made easier by the following wonderful human beings. A couple, uh, you know, special thanks there. And then after Escape, we have a song that doesn't really fit in the classic Metallica album scheme because it is a huge, big hit single, sing-along anthem. And usually we don't have those on the second half of albums. I guess that's more in line with Seek and Destroy on Kill Em All. Uh, and this is Creeping Death. What an intro riff, you know. You have not truly experienced that song until you hear that one live at the start and it just blows you away. 
because this song was like made for a crowd right once you hear the crowd singing to it you just can never go back <laughs> um this one is about like i think they were watching the film the ten commandments and the biblical story of moses trying to uh, free the hebrews from the pharaoh um, and then you know they go he parts the red sea go across the red sea and the army can't get them um, and then eventually this ten commandments story was made into the amazing animated film the prince of egypt which was one of dreamwork animation's first films um, so yeah it's a great great movie great story you know <laughs> um and so this was about that because this was inspired by the plagues scene right um when the pharaoh ramses refuses to let those people go god sends the plagues over on the pharaoh and his people right? that's what the lyrics are slaves hebrew was born to serve to the pharaoh heed to his every word live in fear faith of the unknown one the deliverer wait something must be done for a hundred years now let my people go land of goshen go i will be with thee bush of fire blood running red and strong down the nile plague darkness three days long hell to fire So it's about or that the bit at the end right lamb's blood painted door i shall pass right plague with a plague kills the firstborn son of every family unless you have the lamb's blood painted against the door uh, and then the chorus the big sing-along chorus you ready <laughs> so let it be written so let it be done I've said you by the chosen one So let it be written So let it be done To kill the firstborn pharaoh's son I'm creeping to death Yeah And then the, the big part in the middle There's a really great solo It's one of Kirk Hammett's best solos I think The way that like the backing to the solo moves from each of the main riffs and he manages to make his solo and the runs fit in so well it has a great combination of like noise and shredding and melody it's all around a great solo and then we get to the other big chant song right let's thousand people yelling die brilliant then this brings us into the final song of the album the lengthy instrumental and this one is one of my favorite metallica songs because as you have no doubt seen i do really like my lovecraft stuff so to have a instrumental all inspired by the story call of cthulhu we now here have the song the call of cthulhu and i'm wondering if perhaps they changed the name so that there wasn't a copyright thing going on perhaps i'm not sure but that is okay because the song we have is awesome and as many have pointed out 
the main riff in the intro is this ascending D minor scale, which is, or was it, it's an ascending chromatic, if my terminology is correct on there, um, which is the same ascending D chromatic intro in Megadeth's Hangar 18, which is why Mustaine has a writing credit on this one. Though they are, like, completely different. Like, um, Hangar 18's is just straight chugging the chords. And Call of Cthulhu is like a finger picking thing. So, I guess they still had to credit it to him because it was close enough and was definitely inspired by. Um, but this one, this one you gotta listen carefully for and pay attention to the bass. Because all that crazy, weird, wah distortion stuff you hear throughout the song, like the dun 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 wow, bah, 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 that's Cliff going absolutely apeshit on his bass. And it is a little low in the mix, I will agree. But also, it's like the idea of this weird monster lurking beneath the sea. So I definitely, I definitely like it for the spooky vibe. Um, if you really want to see it properly, like go watch a really good bass cover of the song, and you can truly see what's all going on on there. It is quite spectacular indeed. So perhaps I'm a little biased in, you know, liking this song because as a bass player and someone who likes good bass when the bass is really unique. It is really nice to see that stand out here in this song, and it has such a unique, epic sound in the end. Right? Bam, down, 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 down. Like I hear the end of this song, I just picture like Cthulhu rising out of the lake, and his arms stretch high as he just smashes it down and just destroys everything and lays waste to the earth. Right? Ah, so good. It's always nice when a, an instrumental song manages to conjure up specific stories and images without ever having to have a single lyric spoken, just on title and association alone. And Ride the Lightning definitely does that all very well, that's for sure. I do think this album is quite the step up from Kill 'Em All because there's more variety in the song structure and the sound. It's not like, oh, every song's the fast one. It's It's got its own thing to it. I really dig it. Really dig it. Okay, next up we have what is probably my favorite Metallica album, just by a little bit. It's a pretty close competition. This is their third album from 1986. It is Master of Puppets. As you see here, there are these gravestones one with a dog tag, one with a soldier's helmet on it, and this hand up in the sky controlling them, right? Like controlling the puppets, pulling your strings. So this album is probably my favorite because I think there are no weak songs on this album. I love every song. Not all of my favorites for sure, but I think it's the most consistent and their best sounding one. In my opinion, I love the sound on this album. So, same lineup for this album. Nice photos again on the back here. As you can see, whoa, look at that crowd, right? Pretty great. So, here we see the Metallica track listing formula continue because we have the first song is the fast song that opens with a acoustic intro, and it is probably my favorite Metallica song, and it is Battery. So, Battery. My favorite one, I love the version that they played with the symphony, that is the one I like the most, and this is a great fast song, it's thrashy, and just gets you pumped, you know, 
right? It makes you want to ask, are you alive? How does it feel to be alive? Right? It's great. Um, the title track is next, right? Title track, Master of Puppets. One of their most well-known songs, I think, and another one that they've pretty much played at almost every show. And for good reason. It is a very good song. And I don't care if it's overplayed. I think it's always an awesome one. And if you go a while without hearing it and you come back to it, you're like, oh yeah, this song still kicks all the ass. Um, this one is... To me, it's about like the idea of being controlled by drugs and drug addiction. In fact, this isn't like a straight up concept album, but I feel like a lot of the songs in some way are about being controlled by forces beyond our ability to control, right? I'm not sure exactly what Battery is about, but that just seems to be like this um, being a slave to like, like anger and aggression, right? Pounding out aggression turns into a session. Can I kill a bat or a re? Mashing not believers, never ending poet, and say, right? Very brutal. <laughs> and yeah, Master of Puppets. I feel it's about drugs because you have the lines like, uh, needle work the way, never you betray, life of death becoming clearer, pain monopoly, ritual misery, chop your breakfast on a mirror, right? Like, chopping lines of, of coke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very brutal song, very sad song, but you know, great, uh, great lyrics, great, very uh, anthematic, right? Everyone likes to sing along to that pre-chorus, right? Come crawling faster. So, so it's a good one. And fun fact, there's a weird note bend in the solo. I thought for the longest time it was that real high note that he plays the wow 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 but it's actually like one of the bends afterwards where um kirk while he was recording he actually managed to like pull the string like off of the little notch that holds the strings up at the top of the neck of the guitar and it caused this really weird sound it's very subtle but if you listen you hear it um and you can never really recreate that but it's a pretty cool happy little accident Next we have another Cthulhu Lovecraft song, and it is The Thing That Should Not Be. And, you know, I think they just credit all the lyrics to, like, you know, whoever wrote the song, and Burton doesn't have a writing credit on it, but, like, I'm pretty sure he was the one who was into lots of the Cthulhu-type stuff. Sounds like it would be his thing. This one's unique because the song is actually, and the guitars are tuned to D standard instead of your usual E standard, which Metallica doesn't do very often. And yeah, it's another Cthulhu one, right? Great old one, Forbidden Sight, he searches, Hunter of the Shadows is rising. It madness you dwell. Um, and then there is literally a line in the song that is a line from a passage in Call of Cthulhu, the book. Not dead, which eternal lie. Stranger eons, death may die. Great image. Drain you of your sanity. Face the thing that should not be. Bum, 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 bam, bum, bam. That ending, that final riff. Just fades out like that. Again, third song is a slow, heavy one. And then that means the fourth song is a slow ballad song that builds up to a heavy ending. In this case, it is Welcome Home Sanitarium. Which I'm pretty sure was inspired by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the great Jack Nicholson film. And it's about, you know, being 
trapped in a sanitarium and thinking that everything outside is going to kill you and you've got to stay in here. It's for your own good. Um, and then, you know, eventually it builds up to another heavy riff. This one's good, though I think it's not as good as some of the other Metallica ballads like Fade to Black or Warm. Uh, but still a pretty great one. Funny enough, I, when I was younger, I likened this song to that Michael Bay movie, The Island. Wasn't that with, like, was it with Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson, I think? Because <laughs> just in that movie, it's like there's all these people here and they're trapped in there and then they realize it's all like a big experiment to, like, sell clones or something like that, right? Like, <laughs> I liked that movie when I was younger and I'm sure if I went back and I watched it, I probably would I'm too much of a cynic now. Uh, then we have side two, which is going to contain the deep cuts. And there are two very good deep cuts on this one. First one being Disposable Heroes, which is about, you know, soldiers being controlled by the general, and they're just simply there to die. Soldier boy, made of clay, now an empty shell. 21, only son. But he served us well, bred to kill, not to care, do just as we say. Finished here, greeting's death, he's yours to take away. Right. I love this thing. Left to die with only friend, alone I clench my gun. Right. Life planned out before my birth, nothing could I say. And it's got, you know, this guitar that's very like a, a chugging machine gun guitar riff. Dun, 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 I don't know, I think when everyone talks about how all these essential workers and the, the frontline workers and we cheer them on, yay, you're so brave for going out to the front line and doing the essential services for us. I'm just thinking, nah, we're only doing it because we have to, because if we don't, we don't have enough money to pay rent and then we die because capitalism. And, you know, so essentially we are disposable heroes just in a different type of war, you know, not the physical war, but like the, you know, the, the capitalist war. That's not to get all like, you know, we live inside a dream, man, but that's how it is, right? Oh, we thank everyone so much for doing all these brave things, and yeah, most of us aren't doing it by choice. <laughs> We're doing it because we have no choice, and that's how it is, you know? As people these days just like, oh, won't someone think of the economy? Like, oh, what about the economy? Oh, the poor economy. So, that's just me. I'm a cynic. But remember, you're not allowed to bring politics into music whatsoever. That is a big no-no. How dare any type of song and music have a political message to it and have some kind of statement that it wants to say? And then the next song, we're getting even more political stuff because we're talking about that all-time fun topic, religion. Yay! And it is the song Leper Messiah, which is about religious leaders mindlessly controlling the sheep and, like, their clowns, right? Come to see the show, right? Circus comes to town. You play the lead clown, spreading his disease, living by his story. Marvel at his tricks. Need your Sunday fix. Blind devotion came. Ratty your brain. Right. Send me money, send me green. Heaven you will meet. Make your contribution, and you'll get the better seat. Right. Bow to Leper Messiah. I really like the sound to this song. Definitely an underrated one. One that doesn't get played nearly as much. But another real great message tying into this theme of being controlled by other forces. So, yeah, it's a good one, that's for sure. Next we have the lengthy instrumental. This one is Orion. And this is primarily a Cliff Burton song. Um, because the intro 
that really sweet. It sounds like a weird synth. That is a bass guitar. And a lot of great bass leads in this song. And the midsection, where it's like that, like almost like Blue Danube waltz sort of a swing thing going on. It's very classical music sounding. It's like if classical music was metal and if we could have had classical composers live today, that's like the song I would get them to react to. Like, what do you think of this? Right? And it's got a lot of guitar solos in it um, and a bass solo in it as well. Like, just an all-around great sounding instrumental with lots of really cool parts and you know a lot of times I like a lot of bands like big famous stuff right but when we hear them do something a little out of genre and um, unique sounding I also really like that too and Orion definitely has a cool unique sound to it especially with all of that sick distorted bass And then finally we come to the closing track, which is going to be a quick, fast, thrashy one. This is Damage Incorporated, which is just another real brutal, fast one, which I think is also kind of an underrated one. Um, also has a, a bass intro on that one too, right? Really sick sounding. It's like a, the calm before the storm. Now, I remember that there was some kind of note. I don't see it on here. I think it was like there was a parody of like the parental adversary explicit content thing. And they were going to be like, you know, oh, the only song you need to worry about is Damage Inc. Because it has multiple uses of the word fuck. Um, but uh, other than that, you don't have to worry. There are no other shit, piss, fuck or anything like that else on the album so don't worry it's clean <laughs> oh, it's pretty funny these guys are good jokesters right you know <laughs> but yeah that is master of puppets my favorite metallica album probably their biggest one that was um in terms of like a critically acclaimed metal album because their other biggest one that's a little different you know we'll get to that but unfortunately this was the end of an era for Metallica because while they were on tour for it um, in 1986 um, they had a bus accident in their tour bus and uh, in the crash Cliff Burton was like thrown out of the bus and the bus landed on top of him and um, they tried to lift the bus up with a crane but it ended up dropping the bus a second time and then Cliff Burton died in that bus accident unfortunately it's very tragic indeed he was taken from us far too soon and he was quite a legendary player and love his sound so it is very sad what happened with him you know, and people like to get into all these what ifs, like, oh, you know, because like Cliff was sleeping in Kirk's bunk that time, so what if it been Kirk instead, and all that stuff? And no, I'm not gonna get into all that. That's just wrong. We lost a very important musician who made a great contribution to the genre and to art in a really unique way, and it is very tragic that we lost him too soon unfortunately, but such is the nature on the fragile art of existence. So, this one's for you, Cliff. Hope you're doing well. So, after Cliff's tragic passing, things were uncertain where the direction of the band was going to go and who was going to take up the mantle. Um, one interesting note is one of the bass players they had audition for the band was none other than Les Claypool, who would go on to be in Primus. And if you listen to Primus, they basically sound like like Hillbilly Tool, right? Like Tool before Tool was Tool. And like more weird 
Rush meets Tool, perhaps. Right, they're a three-piece with a bass player, lead singer, and a really good guitar player who gets overshadowed because of the bass. And they suck. Obviously, Primus sucks, right? Um, so that would have been interesting. And it's cool when you hear, like, Primus cover Metallica. Like, I didn't know until recently they covered the thing that should not be, and they did a really good job with it. Um, or when they do Master of Puppets, and they basically have the guitar line be played by the bass. Like, that's a fun swap. Um, but eventually they settled on Jason Newstead. Jason Newstead was formerly in a thrash metal band called Flotsam and Jetsam. And I haven't really listened to them that much, but they seem interesting, so I'd like to give them a chance. So first, Metallica, they put out this little EP called uh, Garage Days Revisited, uh, the 599 or 598 EP or something like that. And it was like five songs, all covers of a couple of their favorite bands, like Helpless, originally by Diamond Head, and uh, Crash Course in Brain Surgery, originally by Budgie, um, and uh, Last Caress, which was originally by The Misfits. And there's this fun little hidden track where they do a intentionally bad cover of Iron Maiden's Run to the Hills. Um, so that's a pretty good collection of songs, and I think it was just like a quick little studio run through. Uh, but the production's great for what it is, and you know, it's, they all are really good cover songs. Though it is annoying to see the, the whole reason that the price was in the title of the album was so that people wouldn't charge more for the album than what the price was in the title. And now you see it like reissued on vinyl and it's like $25. Like, oh, what a ripoff, man. It's the $5.98, $5.99, whatever it is, EP. That's the point. Unless, of course, if we adjust for inflation, then the $5.98 is $25 these days now. I don't know. But, you know, oh well. So they put out that one, and then it came time for the next full album in 19. 88, which is And Justice for All. Yeah, lovely album. Hope that doesn't get the video banned. Uh, and then on the back here we have the track listing the photos, and here we have Jason Newstead in all his lovely hair and glory. So this album is a double album, um, and mainly just because it's like, you know, slightly too long to fit onto one side. It's not really like a, I don't know, like a true double album. Like, I think a true double album, I think stuff where it's like, you know, nearly 80 minutes long, like pushing like a CD. But, um, you know, some of the sides on here, they're not necessarily like, packed to the brim and they only have two songs on them, so I think it's more of a technical thing than a actuality, if that makes sense. So, the thing that everyone talks about this album, myself included, is that there's no bass on the album. The bass is very low in the mix. You know, everyone talks about that, you know, like, oh, you know, there's something wrong with this song. You know, people cover it, and they're like, there's something wrong. I can hear the bass. You're not supposed to. And unfortunately, yes, that was because there was a little, a little jealousy on the part of the band about Jason being the new guy. And so they intentionally cranked the bass down low, like, like um, Fleming Russman, he was still back for this album. And he recalls, like, Lars basically saying, okay, put the bass down until I can barely hear it. Now put it down several more notches. And um, it is unfortunate, because you listen to some of the isolated bass tracks on YouTube, and they're really good. Like, Jason's tone is fantastic. It's a f There's a few factors. I mean, one, the bass is put low in the mix. Two, like, the kind of... EQ of the guitars means they're occupying a lot of the mid-range and 
taking over the bass as well, based on the sound of the guitar. And for those moments where the bass is following the guitar line, it, it doesn't just follow that, but for those moments it does kind of blend a bit, similar to Ride the Lightning. Um, a lot of factors like that, unfortunately. There are moments where you can hear it, um, but it is very subtle, um, which is unfortunate. Um, and some people have made, like, you know, Justice for Jason versions, where the bass is enhanced, and they're pretty good. Some of them, I think, go a little overboard. They basically just was like, hey, what if we took the album and took the bass and just went cranked it up to 10, and then it throws everything else in the mix completely off. Like, it just doesn't work then. Right. Um, but some of them are pretty good. There's this one guy where he covered the entire album on bass. He re-recorded the whole album on bass guitar and put the bass at a very good level in the mix. I think this version is probably the best one because most of them rely on using the Guitar Hero or Rock Band tracks to um, have the isolated bass and then turn that up or turn everything down. But you can't do that for all the songs because not all of these ones were on um, Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Um, so the other ones they've just kind of like, you know, added a bass line over it or just like EQ'd it. And um, this version, then again, I forget the YouTube channel, but I'm sure if you search like Justice for All Bass, you'll see it. It's this guy, and he's playing the whole album on bass, um, and it sounds great. And it's very impressive. He does it uh, with finger picking um, because Jason plays with a pick on this album. Cliff played with fingers, so that's very impressive to be able to do what he did with a pick with fingers. And no, there is no correct way to play bass. Stop it. Uh, but let's get to the music, you know. Got a nice liner inserted here, the photos, and. Um, this really great note I remember reading. I have to read it all for you now because it's just pretty hilarious. Um, foul language incoming. If we had to thank all the fuckers who have been cool to us in the two and a half years since puppets, A. The list would be printed so small you couldn't read it. B. There wouldn't be room for lyrics, pictures, and other shit. C. We would have a triple gatefold sleeve. Funny enough, that's changed in the CD version to, like, we'd have a large booklet. <laughs> D. Long lists are fucking boring. E. All of the above. F. None of the above. G. Do you really give a shit anyways? So here's a fuck yeah to our friends, families, drinking partners, and bands we've toured with. You know who you are. So that's pretty cool. Always fun when they leave little notes like that. So album starts off with Blackened, about, like, climate change and, you know, burning trees and destroying the environment and how Mother Nature will take her revenge on us. Oh, how accurate of a song this one has been. You know, smoldering decay, take her breath away, millions of our years in minutes disappears, darkening in vain. Decadence remains. All is said and done. Never is the sun. Right? That's basically what it is. Um, this again is following the Metallica formula where the first song starts off with a quiet intro and then it goes into a fast, thrashy song. But Blackened is definitely the most technical out of all those ones and that's what I really love about this album is it's the most, like, prog sounding of their albums. His songs are very long and lots of different parts and complex bits. It's not like there's lots of odd time signatures, but um, something Metallica's done a lot is they throw in a couple random bars of 2 4 um, instead of 4 4, and you, they do that to quite a large extent on this album to kind of mess with the rhythm a little bit. It's pretty nice. And the main riff to Blackened is a really weird one because you could count it as like 7-4 
but in a way it's more so like like two bars of like four four and then two bars of three four because it's like like it's it's a little odd yeah like four four and then three four or a big thing of seven four and then the verse is then in like three four like one two three It's all over the place with that. Right. Very technical song, very complex. And Jason Newstead wrote the main riff to this song, which you know this song. It's a badass main riff. It's a real difficult one to play, that's for sure. All the down picking. <laughs> so yeah, that's a really good one. It's just sad that when Metallica does it live as of late, they cut out one of the best parts of the song. And it's after the solo, there's a bit where they're playing the main riff, but they're like, the guitars and the bass are playing like on the offbeat, as opposed to the drums. Because like the normal riff is like starting with the low note and hitting the octave. Do da do da do da da da. And then, but they're playing it like da do da do da da da. So it's off, it starts with the high note. And there's a couple little odd bits, and then it goes back into doing the regular way. But it's it's that little slight off bit that's really cool. And they cut that part out live, probably because Lars can't play it now or something like that. I don't know. So, that's a great one. Next, of course, we have to have the title track. And Justice for All. Which is, of course, on the cover I showed you, there was Lady Justice here. Money tipping the scales. Right? The corrupt justice system. There is justice for none. Justice is lost. Justice is raped. Justice is gone. Seeking no truth. Winning is all. To find it so grim, so true, so real. Oh, I've seen versions where people cut this song down from not being ten minutes long, and it's just, no, this song needs to be a huge, long, epic song. And there's not even too much over repetition to it. The only part that is a little long is the intro before we get to the verse. There's a little bit too much repetition there. But the pattern to it's really cool, right? Oh, such a good riff. Um, and man, what a song that is still quite accurate these days, right? You know? Our justice system has failed us in so many cases, and that's what this song is about, you know. So, once again, music is political, and that's what it is. They're saying a message here, and that's what it's about. So, I know that they got tired of playing this song for a while because it was too long, but uh, I'm glad they brought it back for a bit. It's a really good one. Definitely one of my favorite Metallica songs. Is it my favorite off the album? No. No, there's one more that I like later on. <laughs> but it's not what you think it is. Uh, next, we have to have the slow, lengthy song, right? The, the, the slow, heavy one. In this case, it is Eye of the Beholder, which starts off with that pretty simple chugging stuff, you know. Duck -a -duck -a -duck -a -duck -a This one, then, is about, like, basically being, like, told not to listen to what you believe. Um, like a 1984 sort of thing, you know. Truth is an offense, your silence for your confidence. Truths are your lies to me. Freedom of choice is made for you, my friend. Freedom of speech. Speech is words that they will bend. Freedom with their exception. So, basically, this is the type of song where... Whatever your political views are, you can simply say that the other side is the one that's doing it. 
right? Because that's always how it is, right? Um, whoever you are, you are not the ones that are trying to censor speech and censor people. It is always the other person that wants to control the ideas and limit stuff, right? Somehow, everyone is creating a 1984 society, right? Which is, I guess, possible, but also impossible, you know? Like, how is it that we're the ones that are, you know, fighting for the truth and freedom, and it's the other people that are the ones trying to control us and make us think what we think, and they simultaneously think they're the ones fighting for freedom, and it's you guys that are controlling what needs to be said. It's all a mess. I think people these days are too quick to jump to, you know, they're, they're taking our rights, and they're our thoughts and they're gonna control us and everything and and we're basically one step away from being locked away and never be allowed to speak again you know just because you said something that violated the terms and agreements of your favorite social media site <laughs> right I don't know it's, it's a messy topic that's for sure and that's what this song is about it's a very underrated one that's for sure uh, then, of course, that gives us the fourth track, which is the slow ballad that builds up to the heavy ending. In this case, it is the song One. And One, as I talked about earlier, was the first music video for the band. And it was based off the film Johnny's Got His Gun, because, um, which I think actually may have been a, a story at first. Douglas Trumbull... Douglas Trump, who was it that made the film? I don't remember. I actually haven't seen it. I'm a bad Metallica fan. But basically, like, I think it was Lars was coming up with this idea of, like, what if you were, like, somehow like a basket case type where you, like, had consciousness but you couldn't control your body at all. And Johnny's got his gun is this idea of this soldier who steps on a landmine. He loses his arms and his legs. And he's barely, he's still awake in his mind, but he can't move his body at all, right? He can barely move his head. Um, that's what it's about, right? You know, fed through the tube that sticks in me, just like a wartime novelty. Tied to machines that make me be, cut this shit off from me. Hold my breath as I wish for death. Oh, please, God, wake me. And um, this song, very popular one, I think this is one of Metallica's most popular songs, that's for sure, builds up to a really great, like, literal machine gun riff, right? something so simple as do, 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 all the way to right. killer solo absolutely great and the symphony version totally blows me away every time such a good one then of course next on the standard Metallica format we have to have the uh, b-sides the deep cut tracks and we've got three of them this time. First, there is the shortest straw, which is kind of about, like, political witch hunts and, um, you know, not necessarily being wrong, but, like, everyone being paranoid, like, like Red Scare of communism or something like that, right? Suspicion is your name, your honesty to blame, but dignity to shame and dishonor. Which hunt modern day to turning to get the point in disarray, yeah. So, this is a very good one. It was one of my favorites off the album when I first started listening to it. And perhaps it's not anymore, um, but I do really love this one a lot. It's a good riff. It's a nice sounding riff. It's a little odd 
I like it. But once again, Metallica cuts this one down when they play it live. They end the solo, and then they just uh, kind of go straight back into the third verse. They, uh, they don't play that little bridge bit with the second solo, which is unfortunate. Um, then next there is Harvester of Sorrow, which a lot of people really like that song a lot, and Metallica plays it quite a lot too. But I think for me, that is the weakest one on this album, or the least awesomest one. And out of like the big three albums, and even if we include the big four, probably one of my least loved on here. It's a really good one. It's got a cool riff, you know. Pretty nice. And I think this is about like, I don't know, maybe like binge drinking perhaps. Right, drink up, shoot in, let the beatings begin, distributor of pain, your last become my gain, linger with misery, you'll suffer unto me. Um, it's definitely got a lot of odd timing in the bridge bit, lots of like random 6-4 and 5-4 measures, little extra beats in there to kind of throw you off. So, you know, is a good one, but my least loved, I think, because everything else is just so great. <laughs> um, then now we have what is my favorite song on the album, and like maybe like my I don't know, second or third favorite Metallica song, like it's it's hard to rank off the top of my head, but like this one is easily top five for sure, and it's like one of the most underrated Metallica songs in that they never played it until they were forced to because the audience requested it at the Metallica by request tour. And that is The Frayed Ends of Sanity. I love this song so much. It starts off with this like very haunting march riff that has like a Wizard of Oz chant in it. You know, And then that goes into this main riff where the tempo speeds up, and it's a really cool sounding main riff. It like has this, I don't know, the whole song has this feeling of like falling or a collapse. Just like everything's tumbling around you, like your sense of reality is going, because that's what it is. It's about going insane. And um, I love this little ascending bit to the riff. There's like this pre-chorus riff. It's not really a pre-chorus because there's no lyrics, but you know, it's built to the chorus, right? And that's this da 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 da, this chromatic ascending, and then they bring that back for the actual chorus riff, right? You know, old habits reappear, fighting the fear of the growing conspiracy. Everyone's after me, afraid ends of sanity. Hear them calling, hear them calling me. <laughs> so, yeah, it's pretty awesome. And then it has my favorite solo section of pretty much any Metallica song, I think. And for everyone who knows the song, you know the sick riff I'm talking about. There's the build um, sort of bridge bit, which is nice because I talked about how the song is always seeming like it's falling and descending, but yet this bit is climbing upwards like the chorus riff. And it's got this like nice harmony with all these layered guitars, like an onion. And then there's the pre-solo riff, right? There's a little drum fill, right? Pop. I got a tap, right? And then lots of these odd meters to it, like a couple little extra little, little extra hits here and there so the drums feel off it. It's like do da do ba ba do 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 ba ba do ba 
very amazing solo section. And a really cool ending riff too, it's just everything I want out of a good, well-made metal song. So that's a really good one. But yeah, I guess Metallica can never play it because it's like too complex or something. I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised, it's just a shame we never got to see them play the whole thing in uh, the Justice era. There's a bit where they play it, and they're like, oh, you, it just goes on, you don't want to hear the rest of it. I'm like, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Continuing with the formula, then next we have to have the lengthy instrumental song near the end of the album. In this case, it is the Cliff Burton tribute song, To Live Is To Die. Um, this one features a lot of riffs that he was working on and ideas they had. Um, and I do really like this song a lot. It's a very emotional one, but there's one thing I don't like about it, and it's the transition in the beginning and the transition at the end. This song opens with this light acoustic riff. It's a very nice one. It's a nice little classical sounding thing. But there's no real transition from that into the heavy riff. It's just simply, it starts fading, and then the heavy riff starts fading in at a different tempo, very awkwardly. And then the same thing happens at the end of the song. There's a heavy riff, and that just starts fading out, and the other riff comes back in randomly. It feels very patchwork, like they couldn't think of something that would like properly transition the riffs. So they just did this crossfade. Um, might get in trouble for this, but I also then don't like the similar crossfades on um, This Love by Pantera. That's a good song, I do like it, but it's not one of my favorite Pantera songs, and I know for a lot of people it is their favorite, but I just don't really like how the, the clean parts come back in, just sort of fading in randomly. Like they couldn't think of something, so they were just like, and we'll, we'll fix it in post, we'll, we'll crossfade it in post, you know. So, um, but once we get into the meat of that song, it is very great. Um, it's like, you know, it's heavy, but it's kind of sad, and this solo comes in, and it slowly starts getting more somber until it finally breaks down to an all-acoustic part where the bass is actually more audible now, perhaps by design as uh, Mikael Ackerfeld from Opeth said, if it weren't for that riff, Opeth would not exist. And that is true. Um, it's a very, like, proto, clean black metal sounding part, which is it's very nice. And then there's a guitar solo, which I'm pretty sure the second solo in the song is by James, though he didn't play it live when they finally performed the whole song. Um, and then uh, there's a poem written by Cliff, which part of it is on his tombstone. When a man lies, he murders some part of the world. These are the pale deaths which men miscall their lives. All this I cannot bear to witness any longer. Cannot the kingdom of salvation take me home? So, yeah, very sad song, very emotional, but very good. Um, however, yeah, this song kind of then just awkwardly cuts at the end to the point where I remember when I was listening to it, I thought there was something like wrong with the CD or something. It just cuts right to the next song, which is Thier's Eve. But perhaps that could be referential to how his life was tragically cut short. And then the last song, we have to have the fast-paced thrashy closer which is Dyer's Eve, and this is about James' relationship with his parents because they were like, like a Christian reform or something like that, very religious, and they did not believe like in medicine or science that if they were in trouble that God would save them on his own. And so this is about rebelling against his parents because of um, what they were, how they forced him to live, right? Dear mother, dear father, you clip my wings before I learn to fly unspoiled, unspoken, and I don't grow my fucking lullaby, same thing I've always heard from you, do as I say, not as I do, 
So a very great fast song, one of the most technical solos that Kirk Hammett has done. A lot of great solos on this album as well. So, yeah, that's how it ends. Very sudden ending, that's for sure. You know, that's the other thing that song cuts off very quickly at the end. Like it cuts like halfway through the last hit. I don't know why it does that, but oh well. So yeah, this is a very, very good album. The production on it is not perfect. For some, that is a deal breaker. For me, it is not. I still really like the design to this album. Um, and, you know, it would kind of be strange to hear it any other way, because it's like what it is, right? Um, obviously, Metallica have no plans to remix it. You know, they've stated that that's not going to happen. Um, there's been remasters of it, but um, that just, like, ups the quality of the recording, not necessarily changing the mix of it. Though I do find it funny that for such a big band like Metallica, they've had a lot of production issues on their albums, and they have not put out any remixes despite those issues. And then you have Megadeth, who people don't really talk about production issues for them that much, except for Risk. And yet they have put out a whole lot of remixed, remastered versions of their albums, many of them unwanted. Like, I really liked Rust in Peace, but then I didn't even realize how, like, the uh, remastered version is, like, very different from the original recording, because, like, that was the one I grew up listening to. It is quite different, and not necessarily in the best way, you know. So, yeah, that's odd that Megadeth hasn't really had problems, but they fixed them or try to fix them anyways, sometimes to the dismay of fans, and Metallica has had problems, and they're not fixed. We have to wait for the fans to fix them themselves, so it's a little odd. All right, this brings us to the big one. This was one of the most commercially successful albums of all time, and one of the reasons why 1991 was one of the best years for music. This is the one where, for a lot of people, they decided to jump ship on Metallica because they thought this was when Metallica sold out. But it wasn't. We already established it was when they put five seconds of clean guitars in Phantom Lord. Or it was when Fade to Black had acoustic guitars and was a slow song and not just, you know, thrash, thrash, thrash. Or it was when Master of Puppets had more refined production. Or it was when they made a music video for a song. You know, come to think of it, I'm not actually sure then what it is. But all jokes aside, yes, for some people, they do not like this album because this is the mainstream sellout one where they went with a big producer and this good production. And it's not true metal. And to you, all of you, I say too bad. Because the Black Album, Metallica's self-titled album, is great. I love it. None of you naysayers and haters can make me change my mind on that. Yes, obviously, I like the first four albums the best. I'm not going to disagree with that. But that does not automatically make everything else not good. Come on. So, this is where they were working with producer Bob Rock, very famous producer. And they were like the biggest, one of the biggest bands in the world. Um, which is saying quite a lot in 1991 because that was the year of like Pearl Jam and Nirvana and well, I guess they weren't a big band but I always think of you know Loveless by My Bloody Valentine right. and yeah this was where the production and was very like more like to the point and they had it with the long song and Justice they said we're gonna do something short sweet simple like William Shakespeare once said, brevity is the soul of what. This just means you keep it nice and simple and you don't waste my time. So, the big song on here that everyone knows, even if you don't know metal, like, just know it as one of those songs, is track one, Enter Sandman. So, 
This song is a pretty good one, yes. It is not Metallica's best by far, that's for sure. And if you like this song and really enjoy it, there is nothing wrong with that. I really hate that we have to have conversations about what is real metal and what isn't and how if something is not true metal that you have to hate on it or something like that. Like, it's a good song. It's fun. It's a good song. Right? It's about having nightmares and stuff. And Yeah, maybe is it a little overplayed? Yes. It would be nice if Metallica maybe didn't play it at a show and played something else that was more obscure that we don't get to hear. Yeah, that would probably be better, but you know what? I really enjoy it. The production on this album sounds great. The bass is now actually properly in the mix. And I think Lars spent like weeks trying to get the perfect snare drum sound, and it shows because everyone admits the snare on the Black Album is great. So it's all around a very good sounding album. Um. And we get to the point where, you know, I like all the songs, but I don't have as much to say about them, you know, because I like the first four albums the best, obviously. We have Sad But True, which is another D standard tuning song, and it's a very just straightforward, punchy, heavy song, right? Um, again, I think the thing with this one is it's like... You know, a lot of these songs on here is they're ones that are played a lot, so there's a little fatigue from them, you know. You want the greatest hits and stuff, and obviously they've got to play that for the fans and, um, you know, for the people that are there to see the big song. Um, but, you know, for all of us who are more into it, I guess we get so passionate about it that we don't necessarily care anymore about the big stuff. Songs like Sad But True and The Unforgiven and Wherever I May Roam, we kind of end up pushing those ones to the side, even though they all are very good songs. Holier Than Now, another good one, very underrated one. I think it highlights the uh, more simple, straightforward nature of the album. And then they have, uh, well, first of all, about um, Unforgiven. It's the fourth song, so it's got to be the slow song. But they reversed it this time in that the verse is heavy and the chorus is soft. And it's a, kind of a western sounding one. Which is funny because I think that Unforgiven, the Clint Eastwood film, didn't come out until the next year. So they were a little ahead of the game on that one. That's pretty cool. Or was it? Was it 92 or was it 90? Wherever I'm at Rome, there's a sitar on that one, a very eastern sounding one, and a very great killer main riff. It's a, it's a real nice one. Uh, and Don't Tread on Me. That one is, I think, some people gave them some like anti-American comments because of Justice for All, and I guess they wanted to prove that, no, we love America. Like, here's a song about Don't Tread on Me, and it's got like the snake, like that flag that people always say, don't tread on me, I'll fight off the government. And then the government comes and then throws police through the streets, like, brutalizing its civilians, and then, you know, chirp, 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 chirp. So when, when is this properly trained militia going to rise up against tyranny? Or are they with the two? I don't know anymore, right? Um, so, unfortunately, all the... All the don't tread on me people with their flags and their guns and all that stuff. I, I don't, I do not care much for that. But I like the song. It's a good one. You know, the intro's got this, like, classical anthem sound to it. It's really nice. Um, then you get to the second half, and this is where we get some more deep cuts. Stuff that isn't played as much, but is pretty good and worth your time. Like through the never and the god that failed which i think that one's their first one where it's in e flat and um that one is a, another one about james's parents refusing medical treatment because i think they both ended up dying of cancer because they said oh you know well, god will save us and obviously you know god was trying to save them by providing them with doctors to help them you know, but they said no. It's like this one old story joke I've heard. 
it's like, oh, this is a guy out there and he's floating in the middle of the ocean. And, uh, you know, he's trying to stay alive. And, uh, like, a boat comes along and says, like, hey, man, do you want help? And he says, no, 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 don't worry. God will save me. And the boat goes on. And, um, then a larger boat comes by and says, hey, do you want help? He's like, no, 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 don't worry. God will save me. And then a rescue helicopter comes by and they try to throw a ladder down for this guy and say, hey, do you want help? He says, no, 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 don't worry, God will save me. So the guy ends up drowning, obviously, and gets there into heaven. And he talks to God and he says, hey, man, like, what happened? Why didn't you save me? And God's like, well, I tried. I sent two boats and a rescue helicopter. Did you not get them? <laughs> so that's my humble view on that situation, you know. Um, but that's how it is, you know, right? The healing hand held back by the deepened nail. Follow the god that failed, right? Failed to save him. Right. Um, of Wolf and Man, that's probably my least loved song off this album. It's got a decent enough thing to it, but it's just kind of not as awesome. Uh, nothing else matters. That's the emotional love ballad. True love. And yes, it's so cute that the intro can be played on by one hand on the guitar because he was James was holding the phone while talking to his girlfriend and he played the only thing he could with the other hand with the guitar, which was the open strings. Oh, it's so sweet and corny and cheesy, but you know what? Sometimes you gotta have some cheese because cheese is good. Unless you're lactose intolerant or vegan or anything like that. I am not, so I like cheese. And yes, Nothing Else Matters is a very good song. Maybe it's overplayed, but I don't care with that one. And a really great solo from James, that's for sure. Uh, I really like, again, like the closing songs, the less stuff. Like God That Failed, My Friend of Misery, which has a lot of bass in it. And you know me, I like the bass, right? A lot of thick bass to it. Very nice like atmosphere to it. It's the longest song on the album, I think. It's either that or wherever, wherever I may roam. It's got this nice harmony bit with the guitars in the middle. Um, very spooky sounding. So I think that one is really underrated. That's for sure. And then final song, uh, Struggle Within. Also a really good one. It's a fast one, kind of along similar lines to Holier Than, than Thou. Um, but it's a it's an interesting one, right? And it's got a riff after the solo that everyone agrees is a really cool riff, and it's only there for a few seconds, but it's a really cool one, you know. Reaching over something you got to feel. What could change about you? That was real. What the hell? What is it you think you're gonna find? You know, so it's kind of a fast way to end the album. So, I don't have as much to say about this one, but again, it is unfortunate that because it didn't get, like, sounding as true metal, that gets dismissed, and that, you know, it's too mainstream, so we gotta hate it, you know, because, well, you know, it's too mainstream for me. I'm like, come on, like, can't we just like it if you like it? Right? I've had a lot of debates with people I know over the years about this one. You know, trying to defend it and that this is when Metallica sold out. Right? Reach a larger audience. And so, what if they did? That's kind of how it is. I mean, you have to accept that the band gets to do what the band wants to do. And you can choose not to listen to it, and you can choose not to like it, but ultimately it was their choice to do it. You know, you can choose not to agree with it. You can choose to agree with it. And I choose to agree with it, because I think there's a lot of great music out here that people who are being snobs are missing out on. Right? So, yeah. It's a really great album, that's for sure. Really, really dig this one.
just to illustrate how long this video takes me to record and how much of a nerd I am. I'm now filming on a completely separate night because I've been filming for so long talking about the albums of a single band I really like. So yes, I am indeed quite a nerd. Anyway, let's continue. So, everyone loves the first four Metallica albums and most people like then the Black Album if you include that. As long as you're someone who, you know, can listen to music for what it is and not really care if they think it's too commercial or not. But then we get to a little bit of a controversial era in Metallica's career. Uh, and that is Metallica drops a load with load and reload, which we'll talk about soon. So just right away looking at the album you can tell something's up something's a little different uh, for one the logo has changed it's no longer that like lightning bolt style with the really elongated a and the m it's like they've shaved it off here it's this new logo and the art is a little odd and I remember just seeing like the small cover on like iTunes growing up in the CD. And to me, this looked like a pair of feet walking through a fire. Like, here's a foot right here. There's the leg. And then that's like a foot that's like in mid step. So it's a different, different angle. Now, what actually is this album art? Well, um, based on what it actually is, I don't really want to be touching it right now. Uh, this was made by uh, Andres Serrano. Uh, he was like a artist, a very controversial one, because uh, it was in like the late 80s or the late 90s. He made this work called Piss Christ. That was the name of the work. And it was a photograph of a crucifix submerged in a jar of the artist's own urine. And so, for obvious reasons, some people took offense to that. And it brought out this whole big debate on, like, the nature of art versus censorship and what are artists allowed to do when it comes to things like that. So, obviously, Metallica hired this guy to make some artwork for them. And... What this is, is I'm pretty sure this one is like a cover. It's a combination of the artists, either the artists or a cow's blood. There's blood in there, and there's a certain other bodily fluid. Um, no, not saliva. Well, maybe saliva's in there. Um, it's another one that's specifically... Um, testicular related shall we say yeah that's what that's a mix of blood and okay it's, it's sperm yeah it's blood and semen that's that's what it's a mixture of you know so it is a load indeed and then on the back of the album we have a band photo and as we can see once again something's a little different like they've all cut their hair what's going on they have short hair now but but i liked the long hair what's what is this right and now there's this new little logo here i always thought it was like a shuriken or something like that or made me think of cowboy spurs and it's like a classic metallica m but it's rotated four times so, okay, this is a little different looking. What exactly is this? Let's take a look. Well, now we've got a gatefold and a lot more photos of the band. And all credits and stuff like that. And Okay, so what exactly is this album going to be? James here kind of looks like a cowboy. <laughs> well... So, obviously, load and reload 
was where Metallica abandoned the straight up thrash metal sound of the early albums and it wasn't that like general metal commercial sound of the black album this is like it's not really metal exactly it's like a little closer to a hard rock sort of thing and I'll say this that I know that one of Lars's all-time favorite bands is Alice in Chains and that Dirt is one of his all-time favorite albums he had this list where he had his top 10 and Dirt was one of them so I'm like okay so they're huge fans of Alice in Chains who were really big in the early 90s with like Dirt and Jar of Flies and Self-Titled and Facelift um, Sap right a lot of great music uh, Alice in Chains is a very good band it's like 90s grunge but pretty heavy and a lot of guitar work on it too right you know it's not simplistic um, but with that being said you can listen to this album and then you realize like oh it's basically them doing their version of Alice in Chains right like first things first is the tuning I mentioned before that the majority of early Metallica songs the guitars were tuned to E standard with a couple alterations like D standard on thing that should not be and sad but true maybe a bit of E flat with the god that failed and some odd tunings with like some of the ride the lightning songs being sped up for the recording like creeping death and for whom the bell tolls but here now we've moved on to where it's almost entirely in E flat tuning so half step down from the normal standard tuning so that gives it a bit of a different sound now, I like that tuning I think it's really good and uh, especially because that's the tuning Metallica was starting to use live when they do their stuff right usually if you hear them live now it'll be in E flat instead of E um, so you know now it all kind of lines up it all matches so that's pretty cool um, and then it means when they do these songs live if they play them live they don't play them as much um, but now they don't have to down tune those ones because they are already at a lower tuning so that's nice production on this album is very good probably might be their best sounding album in terms of a simple production standpoint like you know you've got the lo-fi 80s stuff with kill em all the master and justice is flawed but it still works for what it is black album it's very powerful and crisp sounding you know with that snare and the bass in it all right get a good copy of that album on vinyl and really crank up your speakers on that one or get a good pair of headphones this one it just feels like it's the perfect balance like maybe the drums are a little too loud on the black album this one I think is like the nicest blend of everything and because this one has a lot more variety in what type of songs are on here you know it's important to have that balance right it's not like every song is just straight up heavy so the dynamic range is important and I think that these albums do the best job of that so yeah from a musical standpoint it is definitely more hard rock blues southern not just straight thrash metal this is not a thrash metal album no I'll defend whether or not some things count as metal but if you told me that you didn't think these were metal I would be like yeah I think you're right on that one you're right on that account so I actually really like load and reload a lot I think they're very underrated a lot of great material on here my biggest issue with this pair of albums is that there are two albums and that's because like they had so many song ideas and they just decided well what if we make like all of them into two records and the crazy thing is originally it was going to be like a double cd release so it would have been like all together like a quadruple vinyl 
I can't believe how that would have gone over, like how people would have even attempted to digest it, because it's not only two albums, these are two very long albums, like Load is literally the maximum length you can fit on a CD. In fact, the final song, they had to fade it out one minute early because they couldn't fit it all onto the album. Now, would it have been better to maybe just cut a song that wasn't the final track? You know, the best one? Like, cut something that wasn't the best song? Mm, perhaps, but... Oh well, it is what it is. Um, so yeah, Load's literally the maximum length on a CD, and then Reload is not far behind it. It's also a very long album. So like, you know, imagine if you wanted to listen to the whole thing, I had to listen to both at the same time. That's pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good stuff on here. It's just, you have to understand that it is different from Metallica, normal Metallica, right? And it is what the band wanted to do. So we have to accept that they're allowed to do that. And if you don't like it, that's okay. You know, you just don't have to listen to it. You've got the classic albums before. And for a lot of people, that is where they kind of jumped ship on this band. But, you know, I like that they were trying to mix things up. It was kind of the style of the mid to late 90s. If you were an 80s band, you, you tried mixing things up and everyone hated it when everyone mixed things up, which is why the 90s sucked compared to everything else, right? And then, you know, you had your downfall in the 2000s and then everyone has a little revival thing going on here and there. I filmed for so long my beer ran out, I had to switch back to rum and coke. Another thing with the, the liner notes here, the little lyrical inserts, is they don't have the full lyrics printed. They just have little excerpts, excerpts from them. So like, first track, Ain't My Bitch, all they have from it is, Damn it all down, damn it unbound, damn it on down to hell again. And um, like in Until It Sleeps. We have, so tell me, open the mirror, there's things inside without a care, and the dirt still stains me, so wash me, until I clean, he grabs you, so hold me, it stains you, so hold me. It hates you so all day. It holds you so all day until it sleeps. So, as for the songs and music, like, I like that there's a lot of variety to this, and this one doesn't exactly follow the Metallica album formula. It kind of breaks that mold a little bit. Um, the one thing that is consistent is that the fourth track is the ballad of sorts, and that there's a the second ballad later on. That's kind of a new thing I noticed, that they started throwing in two, with the main one being the fourth track, and the secondary one being later on in the last third or so of the album. So the main ballad we have here is Until It Sleeps, and that's another one that I think is about James's parents dying from cancer. Um, this idea of like being eaten up from inside and rotting away, I think that's what the song is about. I might be wrong on that though, I haven't looked into it in a while. <laughs> um, and then the secondary ballad we have later on is Mama Said, probably the most controversial song on the album. Um, and one that I like absolutely hated at first because it was on that music DVD and I usually just skipped that one because I saw them like this is not metal this is country music and I don't like it and yes that is a weak Metallica song but I'd still say it's a well done song you know it's got a nice riff to it 
I like the D minor chord progression. And, you know, it's a very emotional one for the band, and I think that I, I like that they were bold and not afraid to do what they wanted to do. You know, and that's kind of how it is when you get to be so big of a band. Like, you could literally just say, screw it, and do whatever you want. And you'd probably still make millions of dollars from pre-orders on your album alone. That is just the nature of the way how it is. Um, this is also the one where we talk about Kirk Hammett using the wah pedal a lot for his solos. And it's definitely there for a lot of his big songs, you know, like... Enter Sandman has a lot of wah on it. Um, My Friend of Misery, just to name a few. Um, a lot of his main classic solos, you don't really notice the wah that much, though. It's mainly now when he does them live, he uses wah on it. Um, but I think this is the one where there was definitely a lot more wah, and he really became uh, Kirk Womit, you know. And again, probably because of the Alice in Chains connection because Jerry Cantrell of Alice in Chains uses a, a lot of wah on his songs and uh, a lot of talk box too, like um, uh, Man in the Box, right? That's one of Alice in Chains' biggest songs and it's got like a lot of wah, a lot of talk box, right? That may riff, wow, 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 plus wah riffs, they're just, they're fun to vocalize like um, Bulls on Parade by Rage Against the Machine. Uh, I'm one of those people where I hear that riff and it's impossible not to mouth it, you know. Now you sound like Pac-Man. So a lot of wah, like uh, in 2x4. Really great one. Very bluesy. Down, 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 down. Great wah there house that Jack built has talk box in it. Pretty sure it's their first use of it. Um, King Nothing to me feels basically like Enter Sandman Part 2. Um, not as big of a hit, but I think I might like it better than that one. Um, the riff is a little more complicated. More bass. More bass is always a good thing. Can never have too much bass. And even James at the end of the song throws in a little off to Never Neverland sort of thing going on there. So they understood that connection. Bleeding Me is like the end of the first half and it's a longer song. It's also a very good one. It's kind of a ballad song but not like a proper one. I'm not sure how to describe it, but builds up to a really great solo. You know, a lot of great solos. Probably some of the best solos that uh, Kirk has done outside of the classic era, obviously. Because, you know, you can't really beat those solos in, like, Creeping Death, Disposable Heroes, Freight and Sanity. But you can get pretty close. For me, it's the second half of the album where the fact that it's a long album and it starts to get a little fillerish that I kind of like notice the style drags a little bit like it overstays its welcome I do think if you could take the best stuff out of both albums and maybe put it into one that was a decent length that it would be an overall better product because as it is I feel like these albums kind of collapse under the weight of their own hubris so like all of side three again is some weaker stuff like Cure, Poor Twisted Me, and Wasting My Hate. All songs I enjoy. There's very few Metallica songs I outright hate. Mm, far from any, I think. Just ones I don't enjoy as much. Um, but if I'm in the mood for it, I might take those songs for what they are. Um, Ronnie. Ronnie is probably like... If you asked me the first thing that came to my mind when I'd say worst Metallica song or least favorite, Ronnie is probably the first one. And I think that's just because it's 
A little meh. I think it's nothing special. And I don't really dig the uh, spoken word part in the middle. Just kind of feels not good. Um, a little too much slide guitar and twang in this one. And it also doesn't help that it's like right near the end of the album. Because if you're listening to the album in full, like I did a lot back in the day when I was getting into all these bands, then that means you've gone through like already like 65 minutes of this style. And now it's one more song that is like that, but not as good. It just feels a little overbearing at that point. And then it also doesn't help then that the next song, the last song, is the best song on the album. So basically now Ronnie becomes that five minute distraction you skip over so you can get to the Outlaw Torn faster. Because it is the Outlaw Torn. And it is the best song out of the Load Reload era. And it is one of the best Metallica songs. Like, definitely in my top ten of them. I absolutely love this one. It's like a lot slower, longer, and kind of doomier. And great bass riff that it's built around. You know, again, bass with like a nice kind of flange or a phase to it. Always good. And... James, his voice is at its best on this album and this song particularly. He holds a lot of really good long notes. And then uh, Kirk has one of his best solos. Starts off very quiet and slow, really builds into it. It just all explodes with a real big sort of tremolo picking wah effect and uses a bit of a slide guitar for a few notes there to hit some real high notes might even be on the fretboard based on the tabs that I read and then the end of the song has this little jam thing going on or like has a nice little outro build to it it's very nice riff love the way it's got this like ascending guitar riff where it's just a chromatic progression going up the scale from E flat and James plays the outro solo for that one which is pretty cool but the only thing that sucks is the song fades out a minute early. They released this little CD version, or I think it was a, a B-side or something. It was like the Outlaw Torn, unencumbered by manufacturing production limits version, where it's like the full nearly 11 minutes instead of the nearly 10 minutes. Uh, it's not much, though. Basically, he just jams solos for a little bit more, and then it just ends. So... We didn't miss much, thankfully. But, again, like, y you couldn't have, like, taken off Cure or Wasting My Hate, saved that for the next album, and then just gave us the full version of Outlaw Torn, maybe? Maybe? You know? Oh, well, that's how it is. Or, or you couldn't have put that version on the vinyl, because, like, it fits fine on the vinyl version, right? Like, give, give, give us the full version. Oh well, that's, that's how it is. So yeah, I really like these albums a lot. And of course, we'll talk about Reload in a minute here. But obviously, like, I'm not saying that these are better than the first five albums. No, of course not. Right? Load isn't Justice, and it's not Master, it's not Ride or Black Album or Kill Em All or anything like that. But it is really good. And I like the style and sound to it. And it was refreshing to hear a band try, you know, experimenting on something that they were really interested in, right? I say it was very derivative of Alice in Chains um, or some other 90s stuff. But hey, I think they did a pretty good job with it. And it's too bad, you know, that um, after they toured for this, they kind of don't play stuff from this very often. There's usually only a a couple songs here and there that make a comeback, and Outlaw Torn usually isn't one of them, probably because it's so long, the song. But yeah, I really dig it a lot. Hopefully, people try to give it a little more respect over the years. So then, of course, that brings us to Reload. Right. Literally just scratched on the 
the read part for the album. And again, it's basically these are like the separated at birth albums because they were all made at the same time. They just picked a few songs to finish first and that became Load in 96. And now the rest of the stuff that got finished was then Reload in 97. And, you know, the same logo, same style. Artwork is once again by Andres Serrano, but this time it is not blood and semen, it is blood and urine. You know, so you can kind of tell. <laughs> but again, seeing the little album art on iTunes or the CD, I always thought it was like some kind of a fire tornado. There's something like, you know, there's the tornado and it's scorching across the ground. And I thought it kind of tied in to the theme of the first song, which is the most popular song off the album. And I think the one that even people who dislike Load and Reload can for the most part still really enjoy. Uh, and that is Fuel, which is definitely one of their biggest non-first five album songs. Um, seen it used in a lot of stuff and like all over the place. Got a music video just about like fast cars and stuff, which is a little atypical of Metallica lyrics. You know, they don't really have stuff about that normally. Um, but it works. It just... It's a real great way to open the album. It just opens with that acapella thing that everyone's memed, you know. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me the power to the side, oh, bow. Right? And just really kicks you right in the face with it, you know. Um, and anytime they play it live, you know, you get to see lots of pyrotechnics. So that's pretty great, right? Always is a good song live and played even faster live. Lots of great drum fills. So that's one that I think everyone can really enjoy, so that's good. But unfortunately for many people, it's the first song on the album, which means for some, once you've heard that, it's okay, now we're done, we can move on. But if you did, you'd, you'd miss out on a lot of good stuff here. You know, like, we can get through it, you know, talk about it. Um, now once again on the back we got more short hair, you know, they cut their hair, man, what sellouts, the other thing as well, this is more critiques of Metallica, Metallica being a sellout band, um, because they were trying to be less metal and appeal to more of a standard wide audience, but I always thought that if they were going to be sellouts, why would you switch out your established sound to one that people weren't going to enjoy as much. You know, I don't know, I think that's a pretty bad sellout decision. <laughs> but I guess since the grunge stuff was popular in the 90s, that that made it selling out to make grunge stuff in the 90s. You now just to illustrate how they're similar, right, like it's the same style as set up with the gatefold with the little pictures around and uh, liner notes and all that. All right, short hair. <laughs> yeah. This one, I think, is now even more varied than Reload. Um, it's got the same lyrical inserts where it's only partial lyrics with those like Rorschach tests, I guess. Or Unforgiven 2, we just have She lay beside me, she knew that when I'm gone When I got stuck in the darkest day Yeah, she'll be there when I'm gone Yeah, she'll be there when I'm gone Yeah, she shall be there That's one that people might find a little cheesy is Unforgiven 2, you know, it's like, are you Unforgiven 2, and 2 is in 2, but 2 is in 2, you know, ooh, ooh, clever, but, you know, I think they did a good job of that song, and it might be my favorite of the three, it's kind of a tough one for me to decide, honestly, I mean, uh, um, going over the track list a little more, 
I didn't have the sides listed on here, which kind of annoys me. It's a little harder for me to break it down in categories. Memory Remains is, I think, the second, it was the second song, and it's the second biggest one off the album. Because um, when you do that live, you get everyone singing the merry and faithful vocals, you know. Na, 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 oh, na, 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 na. So that's always fun, you know, lots of good live incorporation there. Uh, Devil's Dance. That's another one that sounds like it's in D. Is that one in D standard? Not sure. Good bass on that one, you know. Definitely a very more doomier sounding song. And I mentioned Unforgiven 2. It's a shame that they don't really play that one live. Um, they've done it like two or three times and one of them they did it on like a music video awards and they butchered it so badly I guess they just decided to, to shelf it. Like, eh, we're not doing that one again. Um, better Than You. I'm pretty sure that won a Grammy award for like best hard rock song. Which is weird because I don't think they've ever played it live or if they've just jammed bits of it and they don't play it often. So weird that your big Grammy award winning song is one you don't play. Um, good guitar work on that one. Slither, that's definitely like a weaker one on the album for me. Just a little meh. Especially when the next one is a uh, Carpe Diem. Seize the day, boys. <laughs> I don't know if they specifically meant to write it about Dead Poets Society, but, you know, sure, we'll take it. Why not? Any chance to reference Robin Williams. Good one there. Lots of great jammy riffs. Very bluesy. Very riffage. Very nice. You know, just kind of groove. Like Pantera. Bad Seed. It's, uh... Fun concept for a song, but you know, definitely a little weird. You know, step right up, ladies and gentlemen, and see here, folks, the man who told the truth. Yeah. Um, and of course, just like Load, a lot of really good, underrated stuff here that does not get the love it deserves, like Where the Wild Things Are, Toy Soldiers Off to War. Very creepy one. I'm pretty sure Newstead helped write the intro to that one. It's a very spooky song. I, you know, I'd love for them to do that one a little more. Play that one instead of Enter Sandman or One or Master of Puppets, you know? We've heard those ones enough. Um, side note, I talked about the Metallica by Request tour. Um, man, a lot of you fans, you really failed us on that one. Like... We talk about, you know, oh, everyone says this song is underrated and we need people to play it. And um, then Metallica gave you that option, only in Europe, of course, you know, because Europe gets a much better treatment than us North Americans, unfortunately. And they gave people the option to vote. And what did they do? They just voted for <laughs> Enter Sandman and won. Like, I want to hear that song you guys play all the time that I've already heard like five times. Could you guys play that one, please? Like, did you not want to use the opportunity to perhaps maybe, oh, I don't know, request something that hasn't been played or doesn't get played often? Like, thankfully, I'm pretty sure Metallica were at least generous in it so that if sorry when the top several songs voted were ones they were already going to play that they just like went down the list and then picked the one that had the highest votes that wasn't already guaranteed so you know at least they were nice about it that way and of course you know the scandinavians saved our asses because it was in finland i'm pretty sure where they all voted for Freight Ends of Sanity, so we finally got that one, right? Um, but, you know, maybe this is just my North American Canadian jealousy sensibilities, but I feel like there's a lot of bands where they do, like, huge Europe tours, like, 
all the time and there's huge festivals out there and I, I feel like we don't really get anything like that over here or not nearly to the same scale. I would understand not wanting to go to America that much, you know, I get that, but even American bands seem to not really want to play America much. And I feel like, you know, my area of the country gets ignored because for so many bands, uh, Canada means like Toronto, Ottawa, and Quebec City, Montreal, and that's it. <laughs> and so if you don't live in the, you know, South Maritimes, you know, Northern Michigan, Detroit area, those four big cities, um, then you just don't exist, right? And they don't tour anywhere. And, you know, I remember it used to be that, like, bands would, obviously bands aren't touring right now. Um, I remember it used to be that, like, they'd tour and they'd hit up, like, so many different places across all of Canada, not just those four cities, and they'd also hit up a whole bunch of American places that were really close to the border. And so then if it did happen to be where there wasn't a Canadian date, you could still potentially get to an American date that was like a couple hours drive away. And if it was a band that was really worth it, then you'd put in the effort for that. But now, at least again, before obvious events happen, it seemed to me that like, not only were bands ignoring like Canada except for the four cities, but they were also ignoring like a good chunk of like northern United States and western United States. Like used to be you'd get cities like Vancouver and Kelowna and uh, you know, in Alberta you had like Edmonton and Calgary and then in Saskatchewan maybe you had like uh, you know, Saskatoon, or uh, Winnipeg, uh, Regina, uh, you know, stuff like that. And then in America, you got some of the northern stuff, like Seattle, and whatever cities exist in Idaho, if it is even a real place, you know, or just some place where potatoes come from. Um, but now it just seems, again, when tours were still a thing, um, the bands were just completely ignoring that whole area and like I'd be looking up like touring acts and the closest city was like Las Vegas all the way down in Nevada and oh they have Portland oh cool Portland Maine I'm like oh okay that's not the one I want <laughs> And so then it'd be like, well, how desperate am I to see certain acts, right? Like, they're not really giving me much opportunity here, unfortunately. And then the other little bias I kind of noticed when looking at, like, Metallica set list is I'd see the set that they'd play for, like, uh, American tours and Canadian ones, and it would be, like, you know, very an obvious one, you know, the big songs, a couple new ones, and maybe one or two little rotations here and there, but pretty similar. And then oh, they'd go to Europe and start touring there, and then all of a sudden they'd be like, oh right, everyone wants us to play Spit Out the Bone, let's play that one now, and do it every night. And oh, let's play like Leper Messiah and The God That Failed, and just bring out a whole bunch of new obscure ones. And I'd be like, I'm not saying I'm jealous, but what I'm saying is I'm jealous. I don't know. I see, like, footage from crowds there, and it just seems like the people are, like, so much more into it, or even in, like, the South American countries. Um, and, like, you see, like, the shows in Rio or stuff, like, I don't know, I think people just get into it a little more in, like, a fun way. Like I say, I go to Metallica concerts here and all that happens is assholes get drunk and want to fight because they think metal music is about being aggressive. Which kind of sucks. You know. But back to this album. Um, Prince Charming is another one with lots of really good guitar work. Very underrated. Low Man's Lyric 
is a bit of an odd experiment. It features the hurdy gurdy. It's like old classical style thing, and um, it's an odd song, you know. Mm, interesting experiment. I don't listen to it that often, but it's a unique take. Um, I would say Fixer is another one that's really great. Um, one of the most underrated ones. That one's got a real cool sound to it. And like Outlaw Torn, you know, these albums both end with really long emotional songs that are very sludgy and doomy, at least for Metallica's style. You know, they're not Electric Wizard. But yeah, I think overall between these two albums there is a lot of good material. Just, again, it's been spread out a little too far, like a small amount of butter scraped over too much bread, you know, thin. But, you know, thankfully with current technology, you don't have to listen to the entire album if you want. I mean, I want to, that's why I have the vinyls, right? <laughs> and I like my old school style, but, you know, you can just pluck your songs out from them and make your playlist and... You don't have to listen to Poor Old Twisted Me or Slither or Bad Seed or anything like that. You can get right into the good stuff. So, you know, I still like this sound of Metallica a lot. I'm not going to say it's better than the old thing, but, you know, for what it is, this Alice in Chains sound, I really dig it. And, again, is it really selling out if you do something that you know all your fans are going to hate <laughs> and it's not really a mainstream thing, I don't know I get Metallica already sold out when they made Phantom Lord that song was the one that ruined everything one album I have to talk about, which I don't own yet, I would like to and it's a covers album and a compilation of sorts it is Garage Inc. or Garage Incorporated and this album is a full-on two-disc album, so what Load and Reload might have been. And what it is, is the first disc is all a bunch of new covers Metallica recorded for this album. So it's a wide variety of songs and artists that they cover, which is pretty cool. Like, they've got um, a cover of um, Discharges, uh, Free Speech for the Dumb, which is a lot more heavy and has more soloing in this version. Um, they have a 11-minute medley of Merciful Fate songs called Merciful Fate, and that's got stuff like Evil and Satan's Fall and Curse of the Pharaohs and a lot of real great stuff on there. Right? Merciful Fate was a big influence on Metallica, not so much in the imagery, but more so in the style of riffage, you know. New Wave British Heavy Metal stuff, and has King Diamond. King Diamond's awesome. We love King Diamond. They have a cool cover of Sabra Cadabra, which is Black Sabbath, but in the middle half, they go into A National Acrobat by Black Sabbath, whose main riff is eerily similar to the heavy riff in Fade to Black. So, probably obvious, um connection there. And then theirs is a little different because the Black Sabbath Sabra Cadabra is like a two-part song where the first half is like the main proper bit. And then the second half is this little jammy thing. It's a new part and it's keyboards and then it kind of just sort of fades out eventually. Uh, Metallica's version is the first half of Sabra Cadabra. It goes into the main bit of a national acrobat and then it goes back into a reprise of the Sabra Cadabra intro, and then it just ends there. They don't play the second half of A National Acrobat or the second half of Sabra Cadabra. It's its own weird mutation of a song, but it flows pretty smoothly and works pretty well. Now, if only they had also thrown in a little bit more of some Sabbath Buddy Sabbath era Sabbath riff on a Sabbath cover for the Sabbath. Sabbath. A really odd one they have on there is Lover Man, which was originally by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, which is a, a very out-of-left-field song for Metallica to cover. 
and theirs is an interesting take on it. Um, very odd, you know. I probably prefer the original, perhaps, but it's interesting, that's for sure. Um, they have a really long jam version of Leonard Skinner's Tuesday's Gone, which I think was recorded live for some kind of a radio broadcast. And then, um, a couple other covers on there, all come to mind. Oh, uh, Die, 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 My Darling, originally by The Misfits. Big fan of The Misfits, and Metallica is, so obviously they'd cover them. A lot of cool little good stuff on there, that's for sure. Oh, uh, Astronomy, originally by Blue Oyster Cult. Very good one, you know, proving that Blue Oyster Cult was one of the most important proto-heavy metal bands. So, that's what is that, um, what the first disc is. Uh, the second disc, then, is a, a compilation of sorts, because the first bit is basically just the Garage Days 599, 98, whatever it is, EP. It's just, it's there on the CD for you. Okay, sweet. So, it's that album again. Then the next bit is they have, like, um, B-sides and old recordings throughout the years. So, like, there's Metallica's cover of Am I Evil by Diamond Head. Amazing cover, one of their best. Um, that was originally back in, like, the Kill 'Em All era. They recorded that one. Uh, and then a couple other songs where it was recorded as, like, a B-side to the single. Like, so you'd have, like, Enter Sandman or something like that released as a single and then they'd cover a song for the B-side for it. And usually it was something that had, like, a cover of Queen's Stone Cold Crazy. I mentioned how they were, um, you know, Queen was pretty heavy back in the day. And Metallica really proves that again, because now they covered the Queen song. And it's even more heavy and more darker, because they changed the lyrics. Um, and then, what else was another? originally by Budgate. I really need to check them out because they seem like a real cool proto-heavy metal band like Blue Oyster Cult, but a little weird. So I'd be interested to see what they sound like. They also did a cover of Anti-Nowhere League's So What, which is like the most explicit of explicit lyrics in Metallica's music. Uh, fun fact, they were supposed to play, like, they were playing a song on MTV, it was either going to be like Fuel or King Nothing, perhaps, or some song like that, and I guess, I don't know why, for some reason they were like mad at the show, so they decided to cover, they did the Last Caress cover by the Misfits, which is lyrics is, you know, like, I raped your mother today, and then they went into So What, which just has like so much swearing and explicit lyrics and talk about bestiality and stuff. And they played that instead, so obviously they got banned from the show and haven't been invited back. Oops. Um, and then the last bit of the disc is like a collection of a bunch of Motorhead covers they did for like something called Motorhead Inc. I think it is. And so they have covers of like Damage Case and uh, Stunned. It's a fun sounding album, you know, it's a little all over the place because there's so many different covers on there and a lot of different styles and different bands that they're representing and obviously some of it's new, most of it's old, all put together into this album. It kind of makes the Garage Days 598 EP a little irrelevant now because you have it on this CD with a whole bunch of other stuff, but I think that was the idea. Widely available. So it's a fun little collection and it proves that Metallica is one of the best bands to make cover songs. They always do a very good job with those, except for the drum fill in Stargazer, which is on Hardwired. They 
Stargazer by Rainbow has such a great drum intro and it's totally half assed in the metallic version, unfortunately. Oh well, that's fine. But yeah, Garage Day is pretty cool. It's a good album. And for those of you who don't like Load and Reload, you might find it a little more traditional sounding in that way. Because half of it was before Load and Reload was a thing. So I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about one of my favorite Metallica live albums. Because um, it was actually the first, like, well, I talked about seeing the music video for I Disappear in Mission Impossible 2 DVD. But also, a friend of mine then showed me some of this, which is Metallica's S&M, as in Symphony and Metallica, not what most people know S&M to stand for. <laughs> So, yeah, this was a concert in, like, 1999 or something like that, and it was Metallica doing a couple of shows with the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Michael Kamen, and it's a pretty cool set, like, it's a two-disc set, and a good chunk of the album. The material that's played is from Load and Reload, because obviously those were the newer albums at the time. Uh, but they got a couple of older ones in here, and they work really well. Like, uh, it opens with Call of Cthulhu, right? That's really cool with the symphony. And also they do the thing that should not be. So they do the two Lovecraftian songs with an orchestra. Nice. And then they have a couple of new songs on here as well that are only on this album. Um, Minus Human, or just Negative Human, I don't know how you pronounce that. And No Leaf Clover. So they're kind of cool for their uniqueness and association with this album. Um, for me, it's this album's versions of A Lot Torn 1 and battery that are so good. Like, I usually tend to listen to the orchestra versions of those songs because they're just so epic. I mean, you know, it's, it's a thrash metal band and they're playing along with an orchestra and everything and uh, works, uh, works real well. And you actually have, like, on the DVD they have the separate tracks where you have just the orchestra or just the band. So that's pretty cool, you know, you can hear just the individual parts, how it all sounds together. So they did a really good job putting this one all together, real cool. And then, just recently, they did, like, the S&M 2 concert, 20th anniversary of original S&M. That one, I have not listened to all of. I know that not everyone was a fan of it because, like, they didn't take any old songs and make arrangements for them. The only songs that were added were newer stuff, you know, like Death Magnetic, uh, St. Anger stuff, and Hardwired stuff. And a lot of people felt they didn't really do a good job with the arrangements, and that the symphony kind of just played along and didn't really add much to it. But we did get to see Anesthesia played on an upright bass with distortion. So, I'd say it's about equal, you know. I'll listen to it all eventually, that is for sure. But yeah, original s and is a pretty cool, unique Metallica experience. Well, if you thought Load and Reload couldn't get any more controversial, Metallica proved us wrong with Saint Anger in 2003. So, so bad that Jason Houston left, you know, he, he, he left the band. What did he do? He fucking left the band. He fucking left the band. That's what he did. Um, so basically for bass on the album, uh, Bob Rock, who produced it, uh, he just strapped on the bass. You know, he decided to play bass on it. 
which is why there's so little of it on this album. It's like barely a presence at all, you know, because it's basically just there to add bass to the mix. You know, not really be its own instrument, which is very disappointing, especially from a band that had two so previously memorable bass players of Cliff Burton and Jason Newsted. Jason Newsted eventually he decided to go play with Voivod, which was a good choice because Voivod's great. Even if not everyone likes that era of Voivod, I think it's pretty cool. Um, his solo album too, um, Heavy Metal Music, that was pretty good. Very underrated. I'm sad that it didn't do so well and that, uh, um, that he has, hasn't really done anything since. And I was also sad because his band was opening for Megadeth on the Gigant Tour. And I arrived late to the show, and so I thought I missed him. But no, it turns out he was actually sick that day, so he didn't perform. Damn it. Damn it. I would have much preferred that to all the other opening bands that were on that tour. <laughs> it's not that great of a lineup that year. Um, and so, yeah, St. Anger. It's another controversial one, that's for sure. Because um, now it's a new sound from Load and Reload. Uh, this time, I feel like the band was really riffing on that late 90s, early 2000s new metal era. And I think another big inspiration on the sound was uh, System of a Down, who had just broke big with the album Toxicity in... 2001, and the timing of that album was just like it hit all the right notes to become a huge album at the time, even if people were trying to say it was an inappropriate album to listen to because of 9-11. Do y'all remember, was it, was it BBC, there was some news channel, but they like put out a list of songs where you're basically like, you're never allowed to listen to any of these songs ever again because it's... 9-11 has happened, and it's it's just, it's too soon, man. Too soon. This is wrong. Um, and it had, like, Free Fallen by Tom Petty on there, and um, a bunch of other ones, I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, Chop Suey by System of a Down was on there. The most hilarious part for me was they had every song by Rage Against the Machine listed on there. I just... You're just not allowed to listen to that band. It's 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 wrong, wrong, too soon, disrespect. So obviously everyone still kept listening to them, you know, because that's how it is. <laughs> um, back on topic though, so you can tell Metallica is really influenced by this sound because now the guitars are tuned mostly to drop C sharp or drop C and a couple of cases where it's like drop A sharp or something like that for uh, Invisible Kid. That song, it's like really, really dropped low. Very, very, very sludgy, that's for sure. And so it's an odd sound, you know. And then the production on this album is very bad, very bad. Um, I've talked about Metallica's had lots of production issues over the years for some reason despite being one of the biggest bands. And we had such immaculate production from Bob Rock on Black Album, Load, Reload, and all that sound. And then we get to St. Anger, and there's, of course, what everyone talks about, the trash can snare. You know, it's like a real garage rock sound, which, I mean, I mean I'm sure they were going for that. It was intentional, obviously, because they thought it sounded cool and raw and edgy, and everyone was just in a bad mood. That's just the state of mind they felt they were in, you know? <laughs> it's like, I'm just pretty sure I saw a review about it. It's like a flash, it's like a single light bulb in a dark, decaying room, like lighting everything and then being kicked on and stamped out by a combat boot. So the snare drum sound sucks. Um, and there's no bass. It's just not audible. And following the guitar doesn't add anything. And the guitars are like buzzy and trebly. And it just all sounds wrong. 
um, it's got some decent songs on it, though, I will admit. Like, this is the least good Metallica album, but I do enjoy some elements of it. Um, like, what, Frantic and St. Anger and Some Kind of Monster, Dirty Window, Invisible Kid, Sweet Amber, All Within My Hands, Unnamed Feeling. Those are all pretty good songs. Um, Purify, not so much. <laughs> um, so again, most, most of them are still decent songs, but it's there's a couple of things I talked about the production I don't like. And it's also the fact that some of these songs are just way too damn long. Mm. Like, this is this is the era where I think the songs become too long. Like, people talk about Justice for All being too long as an album, and really the only long songs on there are Justice for All and To Live Is To Die, one of which is an instrumental with lots of parts to it. And even then, Justice for All feels like it's a lot shorter of a song than it is. Um, you know, it doesn't feel like a 10-minute song. Uh, and then, like, Load, uh, sorry, Black Elm doesn't have any long songs on it. Everything's under seven minutes. And there's a few longer ones on Load and Reload. And they're all pretty justified in their length, even Ola Torn, because that's got a lot of long jams to it. It's not just repetition. But then you get to Sane Anger, and it's like there's so many of the songs are pushing the seven to eight to nearly nine minute mark. And it's a long album again, like over 70 minutes. Pretty lengthy one, you know, close to the limit of a CD. And so many of them, it's just like a song where it has like one riff as an intro for like nearly two minutes and they try to do variations on it, but it all just is, like, not good. <laughs> like, it's like they took a riff and they tried to, like, squeeze it like it was a lime or something, and just try to get as much juice out of it as you could, and they just kept going and going until it was dry. And then they kept going some more, and we're like, okay, that's good. <laughs> like, some kind of monster, right? It's, like, two minutes or something of just the... Down, 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 down. Um, and then it also doesn't help that there's no guitar solos on this album. There's a couple little small leads here and there, or like a couple of sound effects, like after the bridge, insane anger, but no proper solo. And this was because Kirk just didn't feel like doing solos, and they decided not to add them to the songs. So, okay, that's fine, but now it means you've got a song that's longer than your original songs, which had solos in them, but now it doesn't. So there's nothing to break up the monotony of the bridge riffs that just go on forever. And I think a lot of these songs could have done better with, like, cutting out the third verse and going straight into that final chorus, but for some of them they still do that, or, you know, maybe these songs could have benefited from the death treatment. And what I mean by that is, I have another video where I talked about the band Death, the greatest death metal band of all time. Most of their songs, they didn't have a second verse or a chorus in the traditional sense. Like most songs, which the, the structure, the standard structure, which most Metallica songs follow, is to have the intro and then verse A, chorus A, verse B, chorus B, your bridge, your solo, and then potentially a verse C and a chorus C, and then your ending. But most, if not all, death songs never had the verse B and the chorus B. It was after chorus A, they went straight into the bridge and the solo. Then this came back to the intro, and then then it was time for verse B and chorus B. But then the song just ended at that point. Maybe some of them had a little outro here and there. But for the most part, the chorus B was the end of the song. 
So this meant that while the songs were very technical, they never were too lengthy for the most part until you got to some of the later albums um, because there was only two verses and two chorus and the bridge in the middle. All right, so that unnecessary repetition was cut out and I really like that. I think more artists could use to benefit from that, especially if you don't need all that space to, to tell your lyrical story. You know, if it doesn't necessarily need anything more of flavor to be added. But Saint Anger does not do this. No, 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 no. And they have really long verses that go on for a while and a really lengthy pre-chorus and it's all riffing that isn't really that interesting, doesn't hold your attention, and it doesn't help that James's vocal delivery because he's in such a fragile state is just all over the place. Like he tries to sound all emotional and stuff and ends up coming across as like trying to be weird and edgy but but it's not it's just not that good. Um, so, a lot of these songs could have benefited from some trimming and a whole bunch of factors. But the good news is that if you didn't know, I think it was like 2015, there's this YouTube group and they actually went and re-recorded the entire album from the ground up. So first of all, they fixed the production issue because now the bass is at a better level in the mix, the guitars sound better, and the drums no longer have the trash can snare sound. Okay, so we fixed that problem. And then they also trimmed a lot of the songs down by several minutes. So no longer are they eight to nine minute behemoths, they're at a much more digestible size. Now, I listen to a lot of prog bands, a lot of atmospheric stuff, I like Pink Floyd, and yes, proggy stuff, so I like to think that the length of a song doesn't really bother me, you know, my favorite song is Lateralis, that's ten minutes. But what bothers me is when the style of song causes it to overstay its welcome, so if you're gonna make a 10 minute song that's like, you know, an ambient prog rock song and it's like lengthy and drawn out because there's a big solo in the middle or something or, or an atmospheric part, like, that's probably okay. But if you're gonna make like a straightforward punchy metal song and it's gonna be like eight to nine minutes and it's not going to have enough new stuff in it to justify that length, like it's gonna be most of the same but redone to the point where if you did cut it it would have a better impact then yes in that case the song is too long that's why i don't like the style of the last couple metallica albums because they seem to be pushing that a little too much um, for the most part so but this version the the cover they cut it all down for the most part, they did really good with that. The one thing that they cut down, which I wish they had kept, it's the, the kill, kill, kill part at the end of the album, at the end of All Within My Hands. Like, I actually really dig that moment on um, the original album, because at that point it just seems like everyone's given up, and, like, they just finish it, and they end up just throwing everything against the wall and angrily walking out of the room, which is the vibe that that song's going for. Um, which is sad that Metallica, whenever they do it, it's like a slow acoustic song as a charity fundraiser, you know, <laughs> play the actual thing, but angry. <laughs> um, but in this cover version, they cut that part, so it just kind of ends. Uh, doesn't have the same impact as that original album, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, so they fixed the length of the songs, they fixed the production. Lyrics are still the same, but, uh, the guy who sings, he does a really good job with the vocal delivery to the point where I've played this for unsuspecting people and they didn't recognize it was a cover. <laughs> or, or sometimes I'll put it on and 
people will be like, whoa, 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 why are you playing that? I'm like, no, 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 relax, relax. It's a cover. <laughs> uh, the only thing they didn't change was the lack of guitar solos, but that was understandable. They weren't rewriting the album, they were re-recording it. And so because Kirk did not play solos, the band did not play solos when they covered it, so... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a weaker album, that's for sure. I don't like the status that it gets as, like, number one most hated metal album of all time. I, I don't know. I thought as metalheads we were supposed to be, like, tough, rugged individuals with a strict sense of a moral code and honor. But in the end, I think most of us end up just being whiny little crybabies, being like, this was what I thought it was gonna be. I don't like it. Damn vote zero stars. Or if a band comes along that is not like, you know, metal enough, like baby metal or ghost. <laughs> and it's like and it's not actually for you metal, you're not allowed to listen to this guy who's such a poetry just be there. Oh, come on man. Just can't we just enjoy some music, you know? I'm sure there's a lot worse albums out there than Sane Anger. It's just bad for Metallica, but that doesn't make it bad in general. So, I don't know. I dig a decent chunk of it, but yeah, you know, it's weaker than every other album, obviously. That's just how it is. So, after St. Anger, you know, definitely a controversial one, um, but the band sort of came together Jason Newstead having left, they now acquired Robert Trujillo as their new bass player. And he's been in a lot of bands, um, one of which I know is Suicidal Tendencies. So that's pretty cool. Rob, as a bass player, he's a very talented player and he knows how to play all the parts. But the only thing I can say is that so far from what I've seen them do, I don't feel he necessarily has brought any, like, new flavor of originality to the band. Like, he can play the parts and do everything, but perhaps this could be me assuming that, you know, Lars and James's ego is so big that they don't want a bass player to contend with them. You know, someone who's just gonna do the part, which Rob does very well. He gets a couple nice little solo bits here and there, but the problem is that it doesn't matter who they had to play bass because that person has to follow up against Cliff Burton and Jason Newstead, who are two of the best bass players. Um, so he is very good. I don't mean any disrespect to him personally. It's more about like the style of the musician and what they contribute to the band and. I feel it's a little lacking in that regard. Like the bass is kind of there to fill its part. You know, maybe if you took it out, you wouldn't even notice. So that's just my thoughts on that again. No disrespect to Robert Trujillo personally. He is a cool guy. I had a moment at a Metallica concert. Um, actually, you know what? I'll say that story till later because it's about something else. <laughs> um, but finally, we had in 2008. We had what was marketed as the return to form for Metallica, finally doing an old school thrash metal album. That was Death Magnetic 2008. So, this was the album where when it came out, you were all real hyped. Like, oh yeah, there's like guitar solos and a wah pedal, and they're back in E standard finally after having not done that for like 17 years and there's like good lyrics again and like the songs are longer but they're not too overly long like there's still a manageable length none of that St. Anger stuff there's no snare, St. Anger, snare drum it's, it's back to the good old snare and there's none of this bluesy E-flat Alice in Chains western crap. It's true good metal again. And for the most part, you're right. <sighs> but there's one thing I cannot stand on this 
this album and like many other Metallica albums it's a production this album was produced by Rick Rubin who has made so many great albums in the past he did Rain and Blood by Slayer which is you know only one of the biggest most important thrash metal albums of all time and at the same time I'm pretty sure he helped produce License to Ill by the Beastie Boys, their debut album. And I think that's why there's the Beastie Boys songs Fight for Your Right and No Sleep Till Brooklyn, which both feature Carrie King from Slayer on guitar. So if you didn't know, that's why those guitar solos sound like Slayer, because it is literally a Slayer guitar player on those songs, so that's pretty cool. Um, and he also did Black Sabbath's reunion album 13, which was a very on the cusp of the loudness war, but, but it wasn't a full-on loudness war. It was actually really good. The bass tone on that album is just, oh, it's so beefy. Like, they really cranked it up loud. And then the best part was they kept that tone for all the live concerts, right? Nice and beefy the way it should be. Nice and loud. Um, but the production on Death Magnetic is just, it is so awful. I really hate to say that, but that is the truth. It's one of those things you probably didn't notice when it first came out, because you were probably, like, listening to it on, like, a car stereo, or, like, a, like a ghetto blaster, or whatever it's called, like a little boombox sort of thing, or, like, on, like, like, little iPod headphones, right? A really, really bad quality. Um, but when you actually listen to this, like a good pair of headphones, and you compare it, like direct, directly compare it to every other Metallica album, it really, really sticks out like a sore thumb. So, this is the album I use as the ultimate example of what is called the Loudness War. So, I'll try to do my best to explain my understanding of this sort of thing. Basically, the loudness war is like this idea that like recordings, over time, they're being recorded at louder volumes um, to like, you know, beef up the thing because, oh, it sounds like nice and loud and powerful, right? None of those old-timey, quiety recordings and in doing so you're kind of pushing like the threshold of a dynamic range because like the microphones and the their digital recordings they can only handle so much information at once so what you're supposed to do is have this nice balance of all the different frequencies so that the bass carries up the nice low end and then you have stuff that is pushed more to the treble to get this real nice balanced effect. And you can see that if you look at the waveforms for songs, right, all the, the lines bouncing up and down. Um, and so you listen to, like, good quality old recordings, something like that was recorded with real good technology and really well done, like Led Zeppelin, or, because Jimmy Page is such a great producer, Pink Floyd, because they were always real pushing for, like, high-quality technology on their recordings. You listen to those, and uh, there's such a nice blend of all the different frequencies and the instruments. And it's at a quieter volume, so what do you do? You use this amazing little function that has been introduced since the dawn of time called a volume knob. Let me repeat that for you again. A volume. Up. You use that to turn up the volume on your stereo system so that while the music was recorded at a quiet level, you can adjust it to your personal preference. Right? But lately, there's been this trend towards recording at louder volumes to make the recordings louder, and because this is apparently, you know, it's supposed to be better because 
it's more volume and you don't have to turn up your volume as much and you'll notice this if you like ever make a shuffled playlist with like 60s songs and like modern songs like all of a sudden it's just this whole balance this, this imbalance of like the new songs being so loud and the old songs being so quiet and this causes clipping where the waveforms uh, go higher than the proper threshold and you get this real awful like sort of crackling staticky sound and there's some bands where they push really close to the crackling but they don't quite get there one that is like on the cusp is System of a Down which is ironic because I'm pretty sure Rick Rubin produced Mesmerize and Hypnotize um, an example of some clipping that does occur is the song Radio Video right there's a bit in the middle of that song where it goes kind of quiet right turn the line you know hey man look at me rocking now sudden it comes back in with a big sort of scream and during that moment you probably kind of hear that crackling bit going on uh, that's clipping because the it's higher than what the frequencies can comprehend um and this album Def Magnetic is chock full of clipping all over the place and it's really hard to listen to because of that it kind of gives me a bit of a headache um like the bass feels very drowned out so it's there but you, it's harder to hear um the snare drum is just like cranked way past the decibel rate so every time there's a snare hit it's overpowering something and just go and listen to like get a playlist and put on something from kill em all or even the Black Album or Load and Reload and put that on and set it to a good volume and then skip over to a Death Magnetic song presumably one that starts heavy right away like Cyanide or Broken Beat and Scarred and you'll immediately want to rip your headphones off because of how loud it is and it's really, really frustrating like, I don't know how they could have it up this bad and what's even worse is that when the band has been confronted about this they seem to like actively deny it like just like oh yeah I guess it's kind of loud but like you know that was the way we wanted it so that's how we did it really <laughs> this is getting back to what I said earlier about how Megadeth doesn't really have production issues but they remaster their albums anyways and Metallica does have production issues and they don't remix their albums even though they should Ah uh, yes, and I've been at this for so long I now switched over to a white version Because it really tied the room together um, So yeah, like thankfully, thankfully, thankfully when it comes to Death Magnetic there is a solution and that is the Guitar Hero version of the album. See, this album came out right around when Guitar Hero 3 was like a real big one because that game was like 2007 and this was out, the album was 2008. And so what they did was the entire Death Magnetic album was available as DLC for Guitar Hero 3 and you could import it into Guitar Hero 4 when they added all the other instruments like the vocals, the bass, and the drums so that was pretty cool they had an entire album in the game I think it was one of the first big albums to have that for that so that's awesome um, but what's nice is that the way they have to give like Guitar Hero, Activision and all the game companies these songs is like I'm pretty sure the music company that owns the rights they have to provide all the isolated tracks where it's like a track with just the guitar and a track with just the bass and the instruments and this is so that when you're playing the video game if you miss a note then when, when playing the game that the 
audio is able to be muted for just that instrument, right? So, therefore, in the game files, there exists just the guitar track for all these songs and just the bass. So, pretty much, if a song got added to a music game like Guitar Hero or Rock Band, it was a blessing for any of the people wanting to do remixes or analyzing the song because that meant that now they would have access to the isolated tracks. That's why, when I talked about Justice for All, I mentioned that it's very easy for people to do remixes of songs like One or The Shortest Straw, because those songs were in Guitar Hero and Rock Band and stuff. But songs like uh, To Live Is To Die and The Freight Ends Of Sanity, those have not been to my knowledge, at least, put into any of those games. So the isolated tracks don't exist, unfortunately. So for the Death Magnetic Guitar Hero version, because of the nature of the way these songs and the files were given to the company, this meant that all these isolated tracks did not have the clipping issue and the loudness war issue which meant then that people could have this album, the entire album, put together without the clipping and the loudness issue, and it was actually at a reasonable volume and a proper mix. So if you are a person who was put off by the production of this album, like I was when I kind of noticed that it was a problem, then I really advise you to go and check out the YouTube Guitar Hero Death Magnetic remixes. There have been multiple videos posted like that. And listen to that with a good pair of headphones and then go back and forth and compare it. And it is like a night and day comparison. It really is. Because there's like a proper punch to it. Like, it's hard to describe, but, like, I think of it this way, like, if I listen to Justice for All, when you hear the kick drum, even if the kick drum's kind of this kind of flat sort of click instead of a thud, the kick drum really punches through the mix, right? And that's the point of the kick drum in a drum set. It's supposed to provide you a nice, usually a one-two beat on the measure of four, right? A nice nice kick. And when you listen to the Death Magnetic Guitar Hero version, that bass drum that really kind of punches, it's very nice and punchy, instead of the original mix where the snare drum is just kind of hitting on the second beat and really just blowing out the sound, right? So, and then the, the, the bass is actually properly audible, like... I think there's a comment on the video where it points out that there's a bass fill while the guitars are holding a chord in the transition to the heavy riff in The Day That Never Comes. And I never even knew that little bass riff solo thing was there because it's all drowned out by just clipping snare and crash cymbal. So there's a lot of things I could go over that, but Ultimately, if you like the style of the songs on this album, but the production is an issue, then you definitely have to check out the Guitar Hero version of it. Um, I plan on just deleting the original album from my library and putting the Guitar Hero version in, because it's just such an improvement in every way. Honestly, I'll take the baseless Justice for All production over the loudness for production. At least I can listen to Justice for All as is and enjoy the music. Like, some of these songs I never cared for, and then I heard the good production and all of a sudden it clicked like, wow, this song actually kicks all the ass. Bad production can really ruin an album. Definitely, in this case. Okay, but I've spent a lot of time talking about the production. How about the actual album itself. Well, for one, I like
like the CD packaging. It's pretty cool. Originally, it came wrapped in plastic that had the Death Magnetic logo written on it. And it's meant to be like there's this coffin, but the dirt is kind of aligned in this magnetic field. Like if you were to put little metal shavings around a magnet. And then as you open it up, the, the booklet is like stapled in to the CD. Each page reveals a layer of lyrics for a song with imagery. Where there's this coffin logo present throughout it. So there's all these real cool pictures. And it's a real cool way, this layered effect, like an onion, of all these lyrics and these photos. The one thing I do find a little odd is the songs don't really seem to be in any order. Starts with the last song and then has the first song, and that's just kind of kind of random. But I think it's a pretty cool effect. You can't even read all the lyrics because of the cutout to it. You know, just all this death and misery.
housing part of the album. Also a very good one, pretty underrated. Um, and it's got a real nice build in the middle of it up to the solo. Um, and then there's a real odd time riff at the end, a nice heavy one. Though, I, one odd thing about the song, I don't like how it like starts half faded in and then fades into full volume. Like, it doesn't start at zero and fade to 100. It doesn't start 100, it just starts kind of like half there and then kind of starts. It's a little odd, you know, if it had just started at 100 or had a proper intro, I might have liked that a little better. You know, but that's just me being a little nitpicky. So, overall, I would say, well, it's probably a better album than the Load Reload St. Anger era, but I don't know if I like it as much, and that's because, you know, this production really kills it, so I have to listen to a special version, which I don't want to have to do with my music. But the songwriting is pretty good, and, you know, I think we might look back on it as being a little underrated at the time. You know, and it was nice to have kind of a proper return of form back to the regular tuning and the style. So, it's a good album, that's for sure. Like, it doesn't hold a candle to the OG stuff. Nothing does. But I like it for what it is. I just had to get that big rant about the production out of the way because it's such an issue that so many bands and artists seem to have today. Iron Maiden went through this as well with Dance of Death and Matter of Life and Death. Um, so, you know, here's hoping that kind of you realize to properly mix your albums, especially when your random YouTube user can do a better job. That is quite odd indeed. Small little fun personal item I have for you here. My first Metallica concert was in, would have been 2008? Yeah, on the Death Magnetic Tour. And it was in Seattle that I saw them. With the opening bands were The Sword and Lamb of God. And then I saw the concert, it was great. And Metallica makes most of their shows available to download from their website. So a relative of mine took the show from the Seattle show. And he like made this CD set, it's a double CD, with like all this artwork and he took photos from the concert. And look at that, that's real cool. You know, it's a very nice gift. Um, and so, yeah, I just have this like official recording um, from the soundboard basically of my first Metallica concert. And it was a really fun show. You know, they opened with a couple songs from Death Magnetic, and then went into Creeping Death. Anytime you get Creeping Death live at a show, it's real fun. Um, and then, you know, got to see a lot of my favorite songs there. Very fun show. Um, I wasn't into like a lot of the obscure Metallica songs at the time, so the fact that they played most of the hits worked well in my favor, like Sad But True, and Chorus Enter Sandman, Nothing Else Matters, Master of Puppets. Um, Funny enough, I didn't really know some of the covers and the songs they did at the end, because um, I hadn't heard the cover of Die Die My Darling yet, and I hadn't listened to Kill Em All that much, so um, Motor Breath, I didn't know that one, but I was really impressed by it, I really dug it. Um, and of course, you know, gotta end with Seek and Destroy, it's tradition. So, yeah, it was a very fun show, and they did a pretty good chunk of Death Magnetic in this show. Very fun. So, nice to have this cool little CD collection. Very, very, very nice gift. I really, really enjoyed it. One other thing of note in this era is the Beyond Magnetic EP in 2011. So these were a couple of songs that did not make the final cut for Death Magnetic. But they released them on this little EP. And of these 
these songs, there are four. Hate Train, Just a Bullet Away, Hell and Back, and The Rebel of Babylon. And they're all pretty decent songs, I think. I've probably listened to Hate Train the most, because when they were teasing little bits from Death Magnetic, this solo at the start of Hate Train was one they teased a lot that I was really looking forward to. So to actually hear those riffs now in a song, a proper song, when I was confused why I didn't hear them on Death Magnetic, that was pretty cool. Just a Bullet Away is interesting because it's another song that might be in D standard or at least drop D. And it's, I'm pretty sure, a song about Lane Stanley, vocalist of Alice in Chains, eventually dying of a drug overdose. Um, and it has this middle section that feels completely removed from the song in a very cool, unique way. Um, and the other ones like Helen Back and Rebel of Babylon are decent enough. Um, still suffers the production issues though, <laughs> unfortunately, and I don't know if there's a Guitar Hero mix of those ones. Oh well. Don't mind me, this is just Tars from the future jumping into the timeline to correct a few mistakes, and that is that I forgot to talk about, you know, while editing this video I noticed that I forgot to talk about one of the most infamous Metallica musical moments. It is not a proper Metallica album, but I think it's worth mentioning here, and that is Lulu. Lulu is a collaboration album between Lou Reed and Metallica. Lou Reed being a musician who was in the Velvet Underground and then his solo stuff and it was like all over the place. Right? He's a very weird, artsy, avant-garde musician, does a lot of crazy stuff. Like he has this album called like, it's like heavy metal machine music or something like that and it's all made by like taking a guitar and like using the feedback to create like noise and it's a double album of four sides of a vinyl of just that so yeah he's known for pissing off people with his artsy fartsy stuff uh, and that's definitely what this album did. So, um, yeah, for context, it was, you know, they were coming out and Metallica was showing it like, you know, oh, this is our next big thing, right? And, um, then they threw out little teasers of the song, and we were like, uh, okay, what exactly is this? And then they put out the first song that everyone listened to, uh, The Few. And that one, you know, people heard it and were like, what is this? And it has a music video directed by Darren Aronofsky. It's actually pretty cool because he's a, one of my favorite directors. It looks like it was shot like uh, Darren Aronofsky's movie, Pi. Um, and, you know, then the album comes out and you listen to the first three songs and you're kind of just like, nope, that's it, I'm done. I'm not even bothering with the whole thing. That's, nope, dunsies for me. Because, like, it sounds like Lars is just kind of playing freely with the drums, like he's not even playing to a click track or something, and the timing's all off. Um, and then, you know, James is just randomly screaming a bunch of stuff, you know, I am the table, I am the table, I am, I am, I am. Like, what, what's that all about? And, you know, Lou Reed's just all, drunkenly stumbling over, you know, his words, and I'm, I'm some kind of calling a second blessing, guessing, there is no second guessing, and I don't remember much of his lyrics, to be honest, <laughs> just ones that I don't want to repeat. So, what exactly is all this? Well, it's like, based on like a German opera or play, and there's this character in it who's like, I don't know, like, a prostitute who gets murdered, but it's also about, like, sexual submission of sorts. As weird, so a lot of weird stuff on this album, a lot of weird themes. 
episode. I'm gonna be honest, Lulu is not half bad, you know, when I decide to listen to it, which is quite rarely, you know. This is not one I go out of my way to listen to, or I'll just pick like a song from it. I don't really do that. Um, it's one where you gotta be in the mood for it, and you kinda gotta listen to the whole album as it is, because it feels like it's all part of a big story, perhaps. And there's like an interesting concept to it, like people mock that line, I am the table, right? But that line in the view alone doesn't make any sense, it's pretty random and weird, that's why people are like, what, what is this? You actually need the context of the album to understand that line, and I know that sounds pretty crazy, but when you get to the song Dragon, I think it is like near the end of the album, Lou Reed, his lyrics is talking about, um, like, like I'm a submission of sorts, and like, you know, do you want me to basically submit myself to being nothing more than an object for you, something you can rest your feet on like a table, right? So, James Lyon, the view where he's screaming that line, what he's saying is he's submitting himself as a subservient to his master in that line, but it's not revealed that it's like, a, you know, an S&M sort of reference until later on in the album, but that's what it's meant to be. So, you know, now, does the fact that it have a meaning to it and symbolism make it good? Well, no, no, it is pretty silly. Um, the fact that you need some right context for it from a song way later in the album doesn't help. The fact that that was the first song released without really explaining what it was didn't help. And yeah, like, you couldn't have picked something maybe that flowed a little better lyrically, just like, I am the table. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Um, so, but again, like, this, this idea of the album, it's not a Metallica album, it's a Lou Reed album, and it just so happens that all the musicians that are providing the background music for his lyrics are all the musicians who make up the band of Metallica, and so therefore it's heavy. Um, I do think it was a huge mismarket on the album to call it Lou Reed and Metallica and for them to be so heavily pushing it because that meant that people like me who didn't really listen to weird stuff like that at that time who were Metallica fans are going into this thinking what's it gonna be you know it's Metallica stuff and it just carries this wrong image to it right because um, it's not a Metallica album it's a Lou Reed album where Metallica is the backing band um, I'm not exactly sure how much writing added to it, or maybe they wrote the riffs, but lyrically and conceptually it's all Lou Reed's doing, so it's going to sound like something weird and, you know, avant-garde and talking about weird sex stuff, right, like most of Lou Reed's stuff, that's, that's how it is, that's his style, um, so if you kind of listen to it, you got to keep that in mind, it's not really a Metallica album, which is probably why I was so dissociated from it that I didn't even think about, you know, talking about it when I was doing the regular video. Um, so, what was I going to say? I mean, I'm not saying this album's good, no, obviously not. I, I like this less than St. Anger, right? <laughs> um, but I do feel, again, like that album, this is a little over-hated, unnecessarily hated. Like, it's odd and it's weird, but there's kind of a charm to it. Um, my biggest issue with this album is, like my issue with so many Metallica albums of the later years, and that is uh, the length of the album and the songs. Once again, this is a double disc album, and you know, a really long one. Uh, this one though, um, you'll see me talk about it eventually, but this one doesn't cheat like Hardwired being two discs. No, this one's like nearly 90 minutes, so it, if it was going to be 
that length it had to be two discs um, but I feel like the way this album went is that like I feel like Lou Reed came into the studio and was all like hey you guys I got a great idea for an album and we're gonna make some music Together, 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 you and me gonna write some music now. Um, and then, you know, Metallica was there, and James was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Lars was like, mm, money, yes, money, good. You know, and uh, Kirk was like, hey, um, anybody see my phone? Is it underneath one of my wah pedals? And Rob was like, yeah, bass, yeah, awesome. Crap walk. Um, and so then they got down to it, they wrote some riffs, and they jammed the whole thing out in one single take. And then they were like, wow, that was pretty cool. You know, some of those jams went on for kind of a long time, and it was pretty repetitive. Um, do you think we should maybe, like, listen to the playback a bit? Um, you know, maybe tighten it up with a, a metronome or a do any editing to it. Um, you know, I think one of the, the splash cymbal mics was a little too loud. Um, anybody want to touch this up a bit? Um, and they were all like, that's good. And then they released the album. <laughs> like, I feel like this was like a first pass demo version of the real album. And that's why all of this stuff is like so long and lengthy and jammy and no real sense of rhythm or rhyme to it and um, why it just seems like a bunch of aimless preaching. Like, I think in the concept of this record we could have had something interesting. I'm not saying it would have been great, but you know, something with a bit of potential to it. But feels like they just took like the first recording of everything and just went with it and didn't even think to stop and fix it. I, I know I know that's not how it actually went down, but I'm saying that's how it feels. Like, you know, a lot of these songs didn't need to be this long to get the point across, right? I think it can be condensed more. Like, that group that did the St. Anger uh, remix, they need to do a remix, a redo of Lulu. Um, although, since Lou Reed has passed away from us, R.I.P., maybe if we had, like, his isolated vocals from the album, or, I don't know, because no one could probably impersonate Lou Reed like Lou Reed, right? Um, and, but yeah, it's, it's, so it's just way overdone. Like, the last half of the album, it's like all nearly ten minute songs, and most of them it's just either instrumentals or repetition uh, and then you get to the last song Junior Dad which is like oh it's 20 minutes so what's it gonna be and the first 10 minutes are like this slow ballad which is decent but again maybe a little too much and then the last 10 minutes is just like a string section like holding a chord as it fades out and I with the, literally nothing else and I was like did you guys make the string section like 10 minutes long so that it would double the length of the track like if it was 7 minutes of track you would have made 7 minutes of strings I kind of get the feeling that's what you guys did you know so basically I mean if I'm listening to it I, part of me wants to just end it there right because that's the end of the album there's nothing else like that would be like the closing credits music but because you're listening to an album, you're not watching the credits of a film, so it's useless. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, I haven't listened to this album in quite a while. Like, it came out, and I tried to, and I then gave up on it. I came back to it when I heard, oh, you know, you gotta look at it in a certain way. And then I listened to it a couple times, and was like, okay, I... I get what they were going for. Did it work? Well, no. Of course not. Um, but, you know, I understand the idea, the, the method to the madness. Um, you know, 
I do think it's funny. There's a video of like someone bringing a copy of Lulu to Kirk, and he goes to sign. It's like, oh, this is my favorite album of ours. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, I I can't remember though. Have Have Metallica argued that this is like secretly genius or that it's their best album? I don't know if Metallica's argued that it's secretly genius or not, but you know, it seems to be the way it is. Like, like, yeah, this is amazing, and it's exactly what we wanted, and it's totally perfect, right? Like, it's the illusion of confidence. I don't know. So, yeah, like I say, maybe give it a chance, but, you know, know what you're getting into. It's not a Metallica album, and it should never be labeled as such. I'm only mentioning it because, you know, it has Metallica on it. And I thought, oh yeah, I have a couple things to say, and I can at least defend that. You know what? You know, it's it's a bit of an interesting concept, right? It's it's kind of quaint, you know, but it definitely needed a couple more do-overs in the editing room, and the off-kiltered, jammy nature to it doesn't help. I think it needed to be a little more uh, refined, because it just kind of goes on is a little too much, you know, but, uh, but that, that one riff in the middle of frustration, that sounds straight out of St. Anger, right, that was a pretty cool riff, right, that was pretty fun, you know, but, um, anyway, I'll get us back to the original timeline so that you can see where old Dars ended up going, and I'll get us back to the original timeline. Another noteworthy Metallica event worth talking about is Through the Never, the 3D concert film from 2013. So they shot some of this film in uh, Edmonton, in Alberta, and then it was meant to be that that was like the warm-up, but they ended up shooting like a good chunk of the film there. And then the actual main shooting time when they went to film this was in Vancouver, which is where I went and I saw them. So that through the Never film, I was there in the audience for the filming of that movie. Really awesome. That's for sure. It was a really great show. They brought out all the hits. They had such an elaborate stage set up for everything going on. So many pyrotechnics. They constructed a Lady Justice statue partway through the show and then knocked it down when they played Justice for All. It was such an amazing experience. And then, last minute, they wanted to do more like pickup footage for some of the stuff. So they had this one off, like a $5 night where just for $5 you could buy a ticket and then you got to be there while they were filming extra stuff. So essentially you were an extra for the film shoot, but also you got to see them do like a bunch of the songs live because they were performing it. Um, and like, you know, there was like some downtime there because they were like adjusting the cameras and setting things up. And I remember like, in between, the band kind of goofed off a bit. I remember them jamming on Highway Star by Deep Purple and Symptom of the Universe by Black Sabbath. So it was definitely real fun to be there as like a, a member of you know, the film set as an extra. I did see the film eventually and I couldn't see like if I saw myself there and it's hard to tell when some of it might be from the multiple nights they filmed, and then some of it was in Edmonton. What is odd, though, is the credits say, like, filmed at Rexall Place, Edmonton, or wherever it was. Uh, but you can tell that that's not the case, that a good chunk of it was in Vancouver, because there's all the interior shots of this stage, the the... the backstage stuff when uh, the main character of Dane DeHaan is like going around and 
you can see on the walls that there's like this blue and green stripe, which is obviously Vancouver Canucks colors. And obviously I know my hockey because I'm Canadian. We are born ingrained with the knowledge of hockey. So it's a very odd thing to say that it was filmed in Edmonton when you can obviously see that the colors are the Canucks colors. So I don't know exactly how it is, but you know. Point is, is I got to see a real awesome concert and be an extra in a film shoot, essentially. So it was a fun experience, that's for sure. So, fun fact, little story. I'm a bit embarrassed at this point to admit, but it is true, and I'll be open about this, I'll be honest, is that around the 2014-2015 era of time, so, you know, it's getting close to like six to seven years since the last proper Metallica album. I'm going around, doing their stuff, you know, doing some tours here and there, you know, the Metallica by request, so that everyone could ask for Enter Sandman instead of something like Escape or No Remorse. Um, and at this point, you know, I'm talking with people and I'm saying things like, you know, like, oh, you know, what's, what's, what's a band that should just call it quits, you know, go out on a high note, you know, is it better to burn out than to fade? And a lot of people have some talk about this, and there's two bands that I can think of where I'm going back and saying, you know what, these bands, I think just for the good of it, they should just, just, just stop. You know, they have their time, but anything they do will only serve to further tarnish the legacy and not add anything new. One of which was Green Day, who, ever since I had that conversation, has released two albums, both of which are apparently pretty not good, you know. So they obviously did not listen to my advice, because Green Day made American Idiot, which is one of the best albums, and it is probably the last big, true rock album. Because think about it, like, think about popular music and big award-winning music right? Ones that, like, just everyone knows it. I might be mistaken, but what is, what has been a big rock album to the scale of Green Day's American Idiot since 2004? Right? Like, that album came out and everybody knew it. Like, at the time of this recording, what's the big song everyone's talking about? Well, probably like WAP by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. Um, and, you know, before that, it was probably some song by, like, 6 9 Nicki Minaj, right? Songs were just, everyone knows them, right? And they hit number one trending on YouTube. But what is the big rock album? Not just one song, but the whole album being as big as American Idiot. I can't really think of one. Magic Dragons and 21 Pilots, those don't count. <laughs> um, as much as I'd like it to be King Gizzard, that's not the case. <laughs> but perhaps we'll save that for another time. The point is, is Green Day was one band, and the other band that I said just needed to stop was Metallica. Because I thought, well, they're going to spend like so many years writing an album only for it to be kind of meh and overindulgent and it's not going to be that good and it's not going to be classic and you know just just why bother right why bother so then like literally a day later they announced the first song from their new album hardwired to self-destruct and it was actually pretty decent <laughs> I thought, oh, wow, well, you know what? I have been wrong sometimes. It has happened, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, Hardwired to Self-Destruct came out in 2016. And you know what? It's actually a pretty good album. I will give it that. I think I like it a bit better than Death Magnetic. It's 
a tough call. But the one thing that helps it is the production on this album is better, that's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, Hardwired to Self Destruct. And it was a pretty surprise album. And it was cool because they actually had a music video made for every song on this album. Some of which feature the band, others are just like, you know, randomness and stuff and like animated things, but that's a pretty cool thing, real dedication to the style. So, first things first, I have to have a mini rant though on the fact that this album is needlessly split into two CDs. So, the CD limit is like just under 80 minutes, right? And I can think of two albums that I know are literally to the limit of what you can put on a CD. One is Lateralis by Tool. They gave it about three seconds to spare. Granted, two minutes of that is silence between triad and favetoid, but that's a little besides the point. Um, so that's an album that is to the limit. The other album that is to the limit of a CD is Metallica's own album, Load. That album was literally to the limit. They had to trim off a minute from a lot torn to make the CD limit. So, my question is, why is this album, which is two whole minutes shorter than Load, needlessly split onto two discs? And to further complicate the matter, there was a three-disc edition of this album put out, and the third disc had the song Lord's Summer, which was a song they wrote and then didn't put on the album, even though it easily could have fit because it was spread out to two discs. It has some covers they made, like an Iron Maiden tribute and a medley of um, some Rainbow songs and some Dio stuff, uh, and then a bunch of live recordings when they were playing at a record store for a record store day, I think. And that CD with all those extra songs is two minutes longer than the actual album for Hardwired. So why is it split into two discs if it can fit on one, right? This means you've got to change discs if you're listening to it in the car, or you've got to import two discs into your iTunes, right? Why was this done the way it was done? Well, Metallica's explanation was something along the lines of, oh, well, you know, some CD players can't handle more than 74 minutes and stuff, so, you know, it's a little hard on the quality there, so we thought maybe we should split it into two discs. And, oh, we wanted to have this feel of, like, two distinct sides, like two vinyls in the old days, you know. And first of all, um, if 74 minutes is the limit, why is it you have multiple albums that are longer than 74 minutes that are only one disc, like Death Magnetic and St. Anger and Load and Reload and basically every album you've done since the 90s? And, yeah, so basically, from what I have found from my research, is that the only reason they did this was so that they could say they sold more albums. Because on the album tracking sale, a double disc album counts as two units sold because it is two discs. And also, I mean, one thing that was cool was that when you bought a ticket to their show on that tour, they gave you a copy of the album. But also, I know that many artists intentionally do that so they can say that they've boosted their album sales. Like Metallica or Taylor Swift. God, 
it seems so wrong that I'm putting those two in the same category. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately, I feel that the two disc thing with Hardwired was purely a marketing gimmick and a, you know, a sales point of view thing. So it was easier for the album to go platinum. They only had to sell like 500,000 copies instead of a million. And it being tied to ticket sales meant it was incredibly easy. So, you know, I know it doesn't matter that much, especially when you're listening to the album digitally anyways, but I don't know, it seems like a needlessly scummy thing to do. Like, if you could put it all on one CD, why wouldn't you? Unless you had ulterior motives thinking about the sales. Like, I don't know. I've made jokes about people complaining about Metallica selling out for this entire video. But to me, that is the more sellout category of them. Where it was purely about what can we do to literally say we have sold more albums. Not let's write songs a certain way or do things in a certain style or cut our hair to me to be more acceptable. No, no, no. It was literally how can we sell more albums? Well, make it two discs so it counts as two for the price of one. So, that's a thing, you know. Nah. You know, they're not bands now, they're a business. Lars needs his ego. All praise Lars, right? Money good. I didn't even talk about the Napster incident with 2003 era. I don't know. All I have to say on that is, you know, people complained that Metallica was only in it for the money. And, you know, said, oh, they're sell us them, right? But, you know, it's, hey, saying, hey, we want to get properly compensated for the work we've done. It's only fair. And then, many years later, when, again, I can't believe I'm comparing Metallica to Taylor fucking Swift. But Taylor Swift makes the exact same argument about how, oh, Spotify doesn't pay us enough, right? Because they only give them, like, a very fraction of a percentage for each play. All of a sudden, Taylor Swift is a national hero for standing up to the man. I'm like, yeah, Metallica have been saying this thing, like, for at 15-something years at that point, when everyone said they were just in for the money, but you say it, now you're an inspiration. So, I don't know. I guess I just have to accept the fact that, thankfully, the message got received eventually. So... I also don't really like the artwork for this album. The artwork for every other Metallica album was pretty good. I don't know, this one is just, it's just a whole bunch of photos of, like, the band with weird facial distortions. And to me, it just comes off as, like, trying to be all, like, <laughs> metal's edgy. <laughs> Look at us, we're so weird. <laughs> and... I don't know, just something about it just makes me feel like it's very try-hard, you know. Plus, ever since Revolver by the Beatles came out, I'm tired of bands having an album cover where it's all their faces melted together. There are so many bands that do that now, so can we just stop, please? <laughs> anyway, well, how's, how's the music? How's the music? Well, it's actually pretty good. I'll talk about the double disc debacle and the artwork. Production's good. It's not the loudness floor anymore. Um, there's a proper balance of everything. And every song is actually pretty well done and pretty decent. Um, even though it's a long album, I feel like the songs themselves have been shortened down. There's not too many longer songs anymore. None of them overstay their welcome. They're the properly justified length. So that is good. 
and there's a lot on here that I feel are pretty good classic songs like the first disc is all very well stuff like like Atlas Rise has a really great uh, breakdown riff um, now that we're dead is a very kind of Sandman style song but it's good um, Moth into Flame kind of about Amy Whitehouse and you know flying too close to the sun Dream No More they finally brought back the Cthulhu Cthulhu stuff for that and I think it's in D standard it sounds like it perhaps unless my ear is a little off for it so that is good I talked about Hardwired it's a short, simple, fast song you know probably the shortest, most simplest straightforward song they've done in like forever, so that is nice the only song on the first half first disc that I'm a little iffy on is Halo on Fire and my issue with that is is that there is no proper ballad on this album now, Metallica does not have to do a ballad on every album they make you know, they can do what they want on that but it's a little disappointing that we didn't get a proper ballad on here and I point out Halo on Fire here because it's the closest we get to the ballad song but the issue is, is that this song starts off heavy and loud right away and it gets brought down a little for the verses but not enough and there is a second half to the song where it changes key and tempo and there's a really great solo and it has a very nice ending I will say the ending build of the song is very good um, but it's like if it wanted to have a proper impact it should have been that it started quiet not loud and built its way up properly like this would be the equivalent if a song like one or welcome home sanitarium or fate to black started with distorted guitars in the first second and then went into the normal verse right it would not have the same impact which is why Halo on Fire, while being a good song, does not hit with the same punch that I think it could have. So that is a little disappointing. The second disc is, to me, it is like the load reload in that it's all good stuff that I think is underrated and doesn't get brought up as much, but all really interesting stuff, you know. Confusion is very much a riffing on an Am I Evil style riff. Man Unkind is an interesting style, though. It's got a little odd meter to it. Um, the only thing that's a little odd is I don't really like the guitar tone at the beginning. I understand that that bass part was written by Trujillo as a Cliff Burton tribute but I don't know the guitar that's playing along the bass sounds a little squeaky I don't know how to describe it you know it just feels a little odd out of place um, here comes revenge and am I savage I need to listen to those more because I have a problem with melding them both together in my mind Murder One is a Lemmy tribute song. Lemmy from Motorhead passed away. So Murder One, I think, is the name of Lemmy's amp. And it's a pretty cool riff. Pretty good sounding one. Uh, and then it ends with arguably one of the best songs Metallica has made in a very long time. Uh, Spit Out the Bone, which is the most classic sounding song it's fast and it's thrashy and it's even got a distorted bass solo the closest Trujillo has come to having a sweet solo moment in a studio song unless we count the intro to 
end of the line, which you wouldn't even hear properly in the proper production that was on the CD. But yeah, Spit Out the Bone, fantastic song, really great one. I'd love it if they had a lot more like that, but again, this album has a lot of variety to it, which is nice. So, I do really dig this album. You know what? I'll say I was pleasantly surprised. I thought Metallica was not going to deliver, but I think they did on this album, so that is good. So, that is where we are at now, you know? Um, 10 albums, right? Five, load, reload, third. Yeah. Yes, my math is right. 10 albums. Don't know what they're going to do then, because, you know, at this point they only need to release an album if they want the money. <laughs> they don't have to. And if they did call it quits, I mean, you know, that'd be fine. I'd understand it. That's how it is. But... Maybe we'll see what comes up, you know. Who knows? You know, it is what it is. Again, I really love this band and all they've contributed to music. And if there's one thing to take away, it's that don't automatically hate on a band because they're mainstream. And don't automatically hate on a band because of certain fans. And don't automatically hate on a band if they change their style and accuse it of selling out. You know, accept it for what it is. Because, yeah, a lot of stereotypical dudes who like their angry music and stuff love Metallica with their metal militia shirts. And that's not the kind of person I am, not the kind of person I want to be. But I really dig all this stuff, the music the memories I've had over the years, it is all very important stuff for me. So yeah, wow. I can't help the time of filming this, but uh, did we make it? Did we make it to four hours? Maybe we did, we'll see. <laughs> Jeez. This is what happens when I don't give myself a time limit and I just film for however long. Anyway, thank you all for watching this Metallica-focused special. If you made it this far in the video, comment your top five Metallica songs, and perhaps also give me your favorite underrated Metallica song. So, one that we don't hear from them that often, because there are a lot of good hidden gems, that is for sure. So... With that, there's only one way to end this video appropriately, right? Now I lay me down to sleep. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake. If I die before I wake. Pray the Lord my soul to take. Pray the Lord my soul to Say.